Everybody, we'd like to uh, call to order the Board of Supervisors meeting for January 23rd, 2018. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here. If you'd please join us in a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Palacios, are there any changes or revisions to today's agenda? Uh, yes, there are a number of revisions. Um, consent agenda on item number 19, uh, there's additional materials. The Santa Cruz City Council agenda report of January 23rd. Uh, on item 48 on the consent, there's a correction. The item uh, should appear under the general government heading and after uh, number nine. On item number 52, there's additional materials, revised attachment C. There's also uh, an addenda on the consent agenda, item 48.1, which is to direct the county administrative officer in consultation with the health services agency to respond to the issues outlined in the November 12th letter regarding the Mental Health Services Act program, uh, as well as the correspondence from the City of Santa Cruz resulting from their December 5th action at the City Council meeting before the MHSA three-year program and expenditure plan comes to the board, as recommended by Supervisors Coonerty and McPherson. There's also an addenda, item 52.1, which is to consider the final appointment of Marco Martinez Galarce to the Community Health Center's Co-Applicant Commission as an at-large patient representative for a term to expire December 16th, 2018. Uh, item 52.2, <laughs> which is considered the final appointment of Will Forrest to the Hazardous <laughs> Materials Advisory Commission as an at-large labor, representat <laughs> labor representative for a term to expire April 1st, 2021. That concludes the corrections and revisions. Thank you. We'll now ask board members if there's any items you'd like to pull or to comment on. Good morning, Supervisor Caput. Sure. Uh, I'll just comment on uh, number 20, 21, 22, 23, welcoming uh, Lorena Gonzalez to the Childhood Advisory Council, um, Jaime Molina to the Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Commission, uh, the appointment of Edward Banks, Sam Mann, and Joanne Veer to the Pajaro Valley Public Cemetery uh, Board of Trustees, and also approve appointment of Aurelio Gonzalez as an alternate member of the Planning Commission for the County of Santa Cruz. Uh, I want to welcome all of them uh, for their volunteering to step <coughs> forward and helping us out. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, a couple items. Uh, item number 10 about the Vision Santa Cruz strategic planning process. I just want to compliment the staff and thank the general public for participating in this. We've had a great outreach effort. Uh, 2,200 people have responded. I would encourage anybody that wants to have a better idea of what we're thinking about or get their ideas of where we should be going for a strategic long-range plan in the county. It's the first of its type. So I'm, uh, I'm really pleased with the outreach effort that we've had in the county. And I want to thank the general public for participating as they have and encourage you to uh, keep letting us know what is on your mind in this process. On um, item number um, 32, uh, to accept and file a report on the Blaine Street Jail facility as recommended by the Sheriff Coroner Hart. Um, uh, the work is progressing. This is a fantastic opportunity for women. Uh, this is going to open up um, a facility for them. Uh, I think it's supposed to be in mid-February or sometime in that nature. That's gonna be a great facility for uh, what we can do <coughs> for the women who are incarcerated. Uh, item number 45, the two eight, 2018 Measure D resurfacing project. Um, I want to thank again the voters in uh, the county who supported Measure D, more than two-thirds of them. Uh, this will allow us to uh, for, do six and a half miles of resurfacing projects on uh, 21 major roads in the county. Uh, we just wouldn't be able to do it without that support and the support of the public in that measure last November. Um, and also um, on item 47 uh, to 
Uh, just to recognize the appropriation of uh, uh, over a million dollars for the library system, uh, unantic unanticipated revenue. Uh, it's especially important to, well, it's especially important throughout the county, but to my district in Felton, where we hope to break ground on a new Felton library in the summer. So I just want to thank uh, folks, too, for uh, in the county um, and a separate issue that supported the library measure uh, last year as well. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Good morning. Um, there's a lot of good items and good work being done uh, on our consent, consent agenda today, as usual. The only additional direction I have is on the item number 32, which is the Blaine Street uh, Women's Facility. I think it's a really exciting opportunity is that we get a report back in January of next year on uh, its utilization and the programs being provided. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, just a couple of items. Uh, uh, to speak about in some additional uh, uh, pieces. On um, item number 28, which is the appointment uh, to uh, committees and commissions, there were a couple of uh, pieces that were uh, left off, um, and I want to suggest that we add them. Um, we, uh, at the request of Supervisor Coonerty, we uh, are going to make the Community Corrections Partnership uh, on this list, uh, and it wasn't reflected there. The Justice and Gender Task Force uh, uh, should be on there. Both those are appointments that I hold. And then uh, for the Treasury Oversight Commission, uh, I was listed as the alternate, but it's Supervisor uh, Caput who's the alternate. Um, in addition, um, uh, I note on uh, item number 19, the two by two committee, I think this should be on our list in the future uh, uh, for appointments. Um, I think it just makes sense as we, as we look at that. Uh, on item number 32, I just want to uh, recognize the leadership of uh, our sheriff and the correction staff about reopening the Blaine uh, Street facility uh, for women. Uh, it's, there's a clear need uh, for this facility, and I appreciate the hard work of the staff in order to um, uh, find the resources uh, to make this a useful facility once again. On item number 36, I want to express my appreciation to the water a staff that we have here. I see uh, John Ricker in the audience, but I know Sierra Ryan is also a key part of that. Um, this annual report is a, is a great way of finding out what's going on with water resources in Santa Cruz County, and uh, I put it on my must-read list every year. So um, also, we have an a, a event coming up uh, on February 1st. Uh, that's a collaboration between the county uh, the local agency formation commission uh, and the integrated water management foundation uh, at new brighton middle school from 6 30 to 9 o'clock uh, called connecting the drops working together for water and the deputy director of the california department of water resources is the keynote speaker there will be a panel discussion about local water management particularly focused on uh, groundwater um, the groundwater sustainability agencies that have formed here uh, this was a great presentation uh, two years ago, and I encourage people to come out. There's a, there's a lot we need to know about water, and this is a great opportunity to learn it. Uh, so I look forward to the event. Um, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Public Works and the, the Health Services Agency for item number 38, um, receiving this award about the developing a Santa Cruz County complete streets to school plan. Uh, th this is something that we often get uh, asked about and I'm really excited to see this planning going on and I think it will be, it will have a good impact uh, for the safety of students in Santa Cruz County. Um, and with that's all I have. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Thank you for the, the corrections on 28 and for those comments. Uh, I'll just briefly comment on item 46. I'd just like to thank Mr. Strudley with Public Works for all of your work on uh, flood prediction, prevention, and mitigation, and I hope that this uh, grant does come through. We'll now open it up for the community. This is an opportunity for you to address us on items on the consent agenda. You would have three minutes to address us on items on the consent agenda. Please feel free to line up if you're interested in speaking on the consent agenda. Good morning and welcome. Please feel free to come up. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Steinbrenner. Good morning. I was hoping for a bit more time. Um, 
Good morning and thank you. I wanna just point out to the board once again, there are people circling out in the parking lot looking for spaces. There are 15 county vehicles parked in the two hour visitor parking spaces this morning. It needs to be changed. I wanna comment on um, item number 10, the Vision Santa Cruz. Um, I did take the survey, but no one else in my home was able to take the survey at home because only one uh, survey was allowed per um, IP address. So none of the other members of my family were able to do that. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, item 12, um, I see that you're going to be looking at how the board supervisor meetings are structured. And I would hope that there would be some evening meetings included, especially when there are key public hearings to be held, and that the county could consider some vo uh, Skype or some sort of teleconference uh, ability for the public who are out working to be able to participate in your meetings when there are key issues that they're interested in participating in, but cannot take time off work to attend your 9 a.m. Tuesday morning meetings. Item number 18, I am uh, happy to see that you're keeping on top of the UCSC growth um, agreements that were worked out legally in 2008 but have not been upheld. And I really want to make sure that the county and the city are watching UCSC and making sure that they uh, address the huge impact that they're having on our county's housing by not providing sufficient housing on campus and addressing the water issues. Uh, number 27, I want to address the Treasury Oversight um, Commission. There is um, still no one as the alternate for special districts. Uh, when Chief John Jones was uh, released from the Aptosla Selva Fire District, there's been no one to replace him, and I hope that that happens soon. Uh, number uh, 36, I again also want to uh, make public, the Connect the Drops event, and hope that that will be well attended and that the public will have the opportunity for a public question and answer, not merely disseminated into the noisy conditions when everybody has to go around and ask questions at tables. Item number 45 has my biggest concern because in the roads for Measure D, there are zero in District 4 that are on the list that I saw in the documentation, and I wanna know why that is no road improvements in Measure D plan for, for your district supervisor, Caput. That concerns me. And item 47, the library, Measure S. Again, I see $5 million for the Live Oak Library Annex that is really a community hall, not a library. You, That's Arbiter. deceptive. Thank you. Thank you. We welcome other speakers on items on consent. You have three minutes. Just let us know the item that you're speaking to in your name. Good morning and welcome. Hi, my name is Rachel Dedes. I'm here to speak about the MH MHSA um, three-year plan and the city of Santa Cruz concerns. I do work at MHCAN actually, Mental Health Client Action Network, and I identify as someone with a mental health diagnosis. So, um, I just wanted to say I believe that the funds should continue to be managed by the County of Santa Cruz, and I think input from the city would be sufficient and um, not distributed directly to the city um, of Santa Cruz. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> um, so an example of how the city of Santa Cruz deals with mental health are recent permit restrictions that they put on MHCAN which includes um, limiting our hours. Um, we totally had to eliminate the food pantry and limiting the number of people who can actually receive services from MHCAN every day. So, so those are some of the restrictions that they're placing on one facility that's helping a lot and supporting, um, excuse me, a lot of citizens of the city, Santa Cruz. Um, so thank you for listening, that's it. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, my name is Sherry Peterson and um, I, I'm, it's concerning the image can issue. Well, I've been going there since it started, probably 25, 29 years ago. It's helped me immensely. I, I, but I 
studied in uh, Cabrillo and filed reports at Image Can. I've, I've put together camouflages of my children and sent personal Christmas cards. I've become an artist and a poet at Image Can. I've learned the tools that I can live with because we're given our hit our hidden illness that is held against us. We're also given a mental brilliance that is unimaginable. So we're a wealth of creativity. If it wasn't for Image Can, I'd be dead right now. I live in the streets. I've lived in the streets three years and four months. They help me. They, they let me cook there. They let, give me laundry. I can do my laundry there. I can rest there. I can watch TV there. I go to a lot of classes because they're helpful, meditation, yoga, all kinds of classes, karate to teach you how to defend yourself. And I, I ask you to fund, to give us the funds that the millionaires set aside how many years ago and just release those funds to people like us that are struggling. And you should think about MH Can is really a wonderful place that helps a lot of people and open, open the, count to more than 50 and the hours to more than 2 p.m. because I'm depressed when it's time to go home. I want to be there with my friends because we love each other. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time. Good morning and welcome. Morning. My name is Helen Bradley. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm 72 years old for one thing and uh, MHK and I've been going there for about 11 to 12 years now. And uh, MHK has made me a person. I'm a human being, I know who I am. They have groups that has really helped me, food. I was a diabetic, I'm no longer diabetic due to the pantry that we had uh, that has been taken away from us. And, uh, but I still receive a little food that helps me. The groups that I attended, uh, anger management and uh, religious groups has helped me to know where I stand in this world today. Uh, I'm really glad that MH Can is there for me because I don't do a lot of things. I've been clean and sober from alcohol for 28 years, so it's part of my daily uh, basis of a program that I do. You know, when you've been clean and sober for so long, you have to have a program, something to follow by, it, you know, a road, a map. So MH Can is on my agenda. That's the first place I go to every day that we are open. But they have taken our, some of our time, they have taken our time away for one, I do not like that. They have taken days from us and people, the hours, which is not good. Because at first I was just being there all day long and it was a good thing for me. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. All right, my name is Zachary Wendling. Uh, I'm here to talk about the three-year plan and the city of Santa Cruz's concerns. Um, I've re received mental health services um, through the county clinics. Um, I have physical and mental health problems, serious, multiple diagnoses. Um, about five months ago, my kidneys failed. I went septic. Uh, during post-sepsis, MH Can helped bring me out of the ashes. Um, I now have a job. Uh, I am going to school. I'm a 3.79 GPA honor student at Cabrillo. Uh, this is my last semester. MH Can has done more for me than any of the city's services. Um, it's not necessarily like housing or anything like that, but it takes you away from the places that provide that, such as the shelter systems. It puts people into a safer place where they can actually connect with different services within the city. We're given grants. Um, that uh, basically have us do kind of like peer counseling. Uh, during the peer counselings myself, I actually help people. I tell people about the many different services in this city and the maze that it is to get through them or to even find them. Uh, MH Can has done so much for a lot of people. <laughs> These new grants that we've just received are going to make a huge change into maybe getting some of the black sheep of the black sheep that are out on the streets every day in the shelters there for many years. It might actually give them a change in life, you know, uh, with the new peer counseling that we're doing. It's, it's a big deal. 
Um, I'm just really concerned that MH Can is going to lose funds, uh, and it would create a larger problem. So, uh, it, to make everything short, this place also saved my life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. You're Hello, welcome. my name is uh, Vincent Rushing. Um, I want to speak on the MH Can issue. Um, I'm 36 years, uh, 36 years old, and I suffer from mental health issues. I've been going to MH Can for about the last three years, and it's been a safe place to go for me to utilize the resources and be productive. Um, it's helped me be a more productive member of the community, feel good about myself. Um, I go to groups every day, like music therapy. I'm able to volunteer, socialize with others, make my doctor's appointments, and stabilize my medication. Um, I also get to talk to others that are going through some of the same things that I go through. And I didn't know that others go through the same thing. Um, um, and I just want to, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Miles Randall. Um, speaking up on behalf of uh, MH Can, um, I have spent some time in other programs. They were not that supportive. Um, when I first came to MH Can at that time, um, it had blessed and cared for. I had had so much support and abilities to grow and learn and have recovery. Um, I will have 12 years recovery in November 14th. Um, the abilities we have with MH Can with the groups and how the money is spent, um, I would say we're doing pretty good at that. Um, really, I'm just trying to be able enough to have my support in recovery. Um, MH Can has blessed my heart so much. And they have given me nothing but support. I sit there, I go every day, people are growing, people are achieving, you know, the better health mentally and physically. Um, I think that the stretch of recovery is carried out properly. Um, that's one of the main reasons why I go to MH Can is for my recovery and to spend time with my friends. Um, really, I'm just trying to get to the point where my recovery can help other people's recovery. I'm there to support every single person in MH Can. They have given me so much support and so willingness to keep up on my recovery and to have my recovery well taken care of through myself. And so the abilities where the money is going of the donation um, is, I feel that it's going to the proper place. Um, I think that the ability to have recovery in our life will put us in a better place. Um, I do thank you for having us come here today. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your patience. Um, only had a little bit of time left. So um, I love my recovery and I love MH Can. It's been, I have gotten so better, more healthier, mentally, physically, emotionally. I mean, it is wonderful at MH Can. So, if you could just take this words from where I'm at, would be great. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, thanks for hearing me. Could you please use the microphone? Hi, you, sir. Uh, my name is Stephen Manessis. I moved here in Santa Cruz County in 1978. I'm 66. I'm. Uh, I suffer from depression, severe depression, and. I just recently lost my housing. Uh, MH Can has been a lifesaver for me. From the programs and networking that have helped me erase the rage I'm feeling towards uh, the situation in the county, and 
I go to MH Can and I go in there and I'm ready to explode. And I go out and I can actually face the world with some calmness. Uh, it's an invaluable service that really needs the support of all of you. And I just want to thank you for hearing me today. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Welcome. Oh, good morning. Welcome to you guys, too. <clears throat> uh, my name is Shayshana Egling, and a friend of mine years ago told me about MH Can, and um, there's just a couple of points I want to make. Um, number one, um, I go for the camaraderie. Um, the, they've got women's classes there, et cetera. I'm, I think I'm 72 years old right now, and I feel 55 years young. And um, it's really helped. Um, I want to tell you something. When I get really chronically depressed, my minister says, have you been to MH Can? My therapist says, have you been to MH Can? I have talked several years ago with parents that have sung the praises of MH Can because they called me, I've got a degree in psychology, et cetera, and they have called me because their son is suicidal, locked in the bedroom. So I've gotten him out of the bedroom, he's gotten to MH Can, and now one of them even has a job there, very independent. There are so many success stories that reach beyond the people that go there. It reaches to the people that are connected with the people that go there. And we even got a call from out of state because a son was concerned, of, I think it was his mom, I could get it wrong, um, was having a breakdown. People from MH Can went and helped her, took her to Emmeline Street to get medications, et cetera. There are so many success stories that don't bear witnessing um, because they're in the background. I appreciate the fact that some people want to do things with money. I appreciate the fact that they may be well-intentioned. However, I think we need to look at the fact that quite frequently, the well-intentioned actions sometimes can be detrimental, if not weighed appropriately, so to speak. Um, there's other things I have to say, but I heard a beep, so I got a hunch I'm up. So anyway, thank you very much. God bless, and Happy New Year. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Oh, good morning. Um, my name is Sarah Leonard. Um, I'm here to speak about the Mental Health Services Act three-year plan. Um, I am the executive director of MH Can, as well as I'm someone who in my lifetime has been diagnosed with all of the three severe mental illnesses of schizophrenia, bipolar, and major depression. Um, mental Health Services Act funds support many important programs, and any choices about how to change funding should get public input by those who are directly affected, which is actually part of the written language of the Mental Health Services Act itself. It is important to keep funds in reserve to continue to fund existing programs, as the county has been doing. Funds should continue to be managed by the County of Santa Cruz with input from the city, but not distributed directly to the city of Santa Cruz. Um, an example of how the city of Santa Cruz has dealt with MH Can and with mental health are the restrictions that we have upon our business that no other business that I can think of in the city of Santa Cruz has. Um, that, I, that I view as discriminatory. And also the process in dealing with the city versus in dealing with the county as someone who myself is diagnosed with quote unquote severe mental illness. And dealing with the city in my experience was degrading and I was treated in a discriminatory fashion one to one personally and people rolling their eyes when I spoke and talking to me as if I was lesser. And that just right there shows you that there should not be in charge of more mental health funding, in my opinion. Um, the county have, has always treated me with respect as a one-to-one -one human being. They have never rolled their eyes when I've spoke. They have never spoken to me in a derogatory fashion. And that is not true of the city people that I have dealt with. Um, and that, the personal is political. 
to just use a phrase from my activist days in college. Um, and that's all, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and MH Can, someone asked me to say what it means. MH Can is a Mental Health Client Action Network. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments on the consent agenda? Good morning, um, welcome. And M, hello everybody. MH Can's hearing um, actually from people who benefited from this program uh, is very impressive and I thank you all for coming. An image comes to mind related to this of a doctor in his smock and he's got his clipboard and it says, feeling sad, depressed, you may be suffering from capitalism, symptoms, unemployment, uh, <laughs> you know, poverty, and there's a whole list of things, and I think it's totally related to the injustice and inequitable distribution of wealth in this capitalist society. Speaking of uh, money, uh, item, I guess it's 9C on Homeland Security, over $2 million. I've seen over the years Homeland Security grants, and um, it, it seems to me what I've been reading, this has to do with militarizing the police and cracking down on people who are homeless or protesting, I think, well, what are these funds going for? Ms. I don't Ms. find this. Ms. Garrett, I'm gonna just briefly interrupt, please stop our time. The, the Homeland Security funding was on the last agenda, actually, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh not to do. Yeah, it was on last, two weeks ago, that's oh. okay. Yeah, but please, I want you to still have your time, that's why we reserved your time. So okay, there, okay, there thank items on, you. on this but, agenda, please. Okay. Um, nine C. Nine is the is the CAFR and single audit report for the fiscal year ending June thirtieth of two thousand seventeen. The Homeland Security pass through. Yeah. Okay. So it's not nine C, but please. Please but maybe yeah. that, that seems to be part of it. Anyway, I feel that it is actually a detriment to the county to be accepting money from Homeland Security with what it's really doing. Items um, also on the library, on uh, item 47, I think that's a misuse of funds. Libraries should be for books. Uh, not annexes, not Wi-Fi hotspots, which actually endanger the library uh, patrons with all the radiation um, misuse of funds. Uh, number 31 and 32 under the category of public safety and justice um, talks about electronic monitoring uh, for inmate uh, management and tracking. There's already too much of that, and this again, radio frequency ID, ID there's um, money again going towards things that are actually harming the public, but it's under the guise of benefiting the public. I, I think that's also a waste of money. As you can see from the people here, we have real needs uh, for homes and employment and parks, et cetera, in our, our county, that's where the money should be going. It's very disheartening to me to see and read where the funds are going to actually harm people instead of help them. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, sir, welcome. Good morning, my name's Steve Coons. I'm a client of MH Can. I have a mental illness, and I wanted to speak on their behalf. Um, about five years ago, I started going to MH Camp. Uh, they offer food, groups, which I take advantage of about four days a week, uh, do about four groups a week. I've been able to get off the streets with their help, so it's a really important resource for me. Um, I can't say enough about Sarah and the uh, staff there. They treat you well. Um, all the groups are run well. And uh, I just wanted to offer my support to MH Camp. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome for consent. Good morning. Um, hi, my name is Tina Hawkins and I am also here to speak about the Mental Health Services Act Fund. <clears throat> um, it's very short, but um, I would like to say funds, in my opinion, 
funds should continue to be managed by the County of Santa Cruz with input from the city, not distributed directly to the city of Santa Cruz. And, um, uh, and I'll just talk just briefly about my own experience with MH Can. Um, I've been there almost four years. Um, I'm a peer support worker, I'm outreach. I, and I do outreach, I'm the outreach worker there. So I go out in the community and help um, bring, uh, get services for people and get them, uh, help them get housing, get them on, um, help them fill out applications, help them get on Medi-Cal, get um, any type of funding, um, uh, let me see, SSI applications, any type of thing, sitting in offices with them, taking them doctor's appointments, driving them places, and just sometimes just sitting and talking with people and being a companion and just, um, there's a lot of, um, just a lot of sitting and talking one-on-one, -on -one, peer support. But um, there's so many things I could go, but there's a lot of people behind me that spoke before I did, so I think you have somewhat of an idea. So thank you, have a thank, great day. Thank you. Good morning, John Ricker, uh, Water Resources Division Director. Um, I'm speaking to item uh, 18. When I was going over the list, I noticed that one of our groundwater agencies was not included and would suggest that you add uh, Supervisor McPherson and Leopold on the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. Thank you. Uh, you mean item number 28 with the appointments? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that would be item, yeah, the appointments. I, Looked at the wrong one. Sorry. Thank you. No, thank you for that, Ms. Ricker. Good morning, Chairman and members of the boards. I'm speaking on uh, item number 19, Jane Wynn from um, Health Services Agency. I appreciate the efforts to um, coordinate services with the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we have always worked very well together. Um, I just wanted to, um, as the chairman of the PAC executive team, I just wanted to um, perhaps work with you on clarification down the road about um, the role of this uh, county city coordination committee and the PAC executive team, especially pertaining to the item of the PAC redesign the HOPES program. I just don't want to duplicate efforts. Um, if this coordination um, two by two committee is going to be working on the HOPES um, and the PAC redesign uh, program. Uh, I would like just to understand more about what the PAC executive team role will be. I don't want any duplication of efforts and that, you know, we are going to go in the right direction together. So I just wanted to, um, as a chairman of the PAC exec team, who has both city and county staff on the committee and also at time we invite elected official from both the city and the county uh, to weigh in and to provide input on policy issues. So I, um, I just wanted to make sure that we receive some clarification to understand more about the roles and responsibilities between the PAC exec team and this uh, county and city coordination committee. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for raising that. Uh, good morning and welcome on the consent agenda. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, good morning, Santa, Cla uh, Santa Cruz County residents. Yeah, I'll, I wanna be able to comment on line item uh, 12. Uh, rather than having a, establish a, a board of subcommittee regarding the procedures, we should have a subcommittee for public comment. Now, the oral communication, just the name of oral communication is kind of misleading. I would like the public comment to go back at the beginning and be stated that it's public comment. Public comment is people can come and talk about the carpet, water, whatever it is regarding the issues pertaining to the political life of our community, and also the light item agenda. It, it, the light item agenda is, is hidden in a room way back there in secrecy, and it's very difficult for members of the, of the public to peruse the light item agenda. So I think it's, it's imperative that we have a steering committee for the public comment to protect our First Amendment rights. Also, I want to be able to comment on, um, please bear with me, uh, the, uh, the public safety and justice, uh, line item 30. Yeah, for the youth and also the adults that are on probation, they're having a very difficult time getting in to meet their, their legal obligation with the public, uh, the probation uh, department. 
it, and it stands with lack of tr adequate transportation. Rather than them just breaking them off with one uh, day pass, right, maybe provide a monthly pass so that they can successfully complete their probation, um, whether they're youth or adults, I think it's very important. Also, um, I didn't have a pen to mark it down, but uh, line item 37, when it comes to the um, human resources and service uh, administration, you know, like I said, I suffer from PTSD. I can't get adequate treatment over there at the mental health uh, uh, facility in Emmeline, Emmeline, and also my brother, and dealing with his PTSD. So, and dealing with the GA office, you know, the issues over there that we're, we're having in terms of keeping these political agencies accountable, in terms of them just coming at it right, where the social policy benefits members of the public, not adversely affect them, and not making them jump through all these loops it, that's just oppressive, and not sitting down and having community involvement and having a dialogue with, with members to shape the, the policies that affect them. Uh, I, I think that you know, constantly just throwing money t to this agency, we need to sit down and maybe have a, a public audit and then also a performance review because it, it seems like the people are really hostile when members of the public would want to keep these agencies accountable. And we're, we're there with good intentions. We're there because we want a better political life. And the people that experience these, these agencies, it's important that we all work together because there's mounting tension that threatens the political and social order. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to address us on consent? Jack, are you gonna come up? Yes. Please, just name the item that you'd like to speak to on consent. Uh, this is Jack Schultz, good morning. Thank you, for, thank you for doing all this work and listening to all this. I have just something briefly to, to say about item 50. The, essentially the Airbnb ordinance. Oh, that's actually going to be on the regular agenda, so. Oh, I'm sorry. So yeah, just, I'm uh, if you wait a little bit of time, we'll get to the regular agenda. We're still on the consent agenda. Excuse me. No problem. Uh, seeing nobody else, we'll bring back to the board for action on consent. I would move the consent agenda as amended. We have a, a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor McPherson. Did, <laughs> Uh, yes, Supervisor Kennedy. Well, I just wanted to respond to Director uh, Nguyen's comments. First of all, to all the folks who manage CAN, thank you, for, thank you for coming today. It's very helpful for the board to hear your stories and to hear how this organization is helping you. Um, this is the City Council unanimously sent us a letter asking for information. This is us having responded to that letter. There's no policy decisions being made today or funding decisions or anything else. It's just trying to give the City Council the information they want, but your testimony was really helpful uh, in, in under, for us to understand the value of this program. And then for Director Wynn, uh, the, two, the city formed, recommended a two by two committee. It's been meeting for about a year. It's just to coordinate uh, and share information between the city and the county as it relates to issues, at least in North County, around homelessness. Um, it wouldn't supersede or interfere with the PACT program. It's, uh, it's a really information sharing and coordination committee. I just want to confirm that the clerk got all the amendments that were there. You comfortable with all the changes to the boards and commissions? Um, yes, except on item number 28, there were corrections that you mentioned about the, were two advisor groups that were added? Uh, the Community Corrections Partnership and the Justice and Gender Task Force. Um, that in the, uh, for, in, for the Treasury uh, Commission uh, alternate Supervisor Caput, and it was uh, Mr. Ricker pointed out that uh, Supervisor McPherson and I are both on the Santa Margarita Groundwater Sustainability Management Agency. Got it, thank you. Thank you, so we've got a motion and a second for the consent agenda as amended. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Uh, we'll now move on to oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. You'll have three minutes. Good morning. Welcome back, Ms. Garrett. Um, hello, everyone. Again, I want to urge the uh, doctors and scientists on the county, with the county, to sign on to this 5G appeal. And just briefly, scientists and doctors warn of potential serious health effects of 5G. 
I think it's about 180 scientists from 36 different countries are calling for a moratorium on the rollout of the 5G microwave emitting uh, technology that is being um, pushed through. And we already have 4G, 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, and other uh, sources of radiation harming people. So I'm going to make copies of this. Um, there are many scientists and doctors from uh, the United States as well who have signed on. And it says 5G leads to mandatory uh, increase of uh, more radiation. Very dangerous. I was in this room on Friday where the zoning administrator had two items on the agenda of cell towers. And once these are up, they keep in increasing the radiation. The 5G I've read is millimeter wave technology that the military uses to disperse crowds. And it oscillates, it can be 75 gigahertz. Uh, extremely hazardous, and this means people are having involuntary 24-7 exposure that we don't consent to. And as these cell towers go up, the neighbors don't want it, they don't consent, they're not informed, and it's toxic trespass. I know each of you have, related to this, copies of the documentary, Take Back Your Power, and people can see takebackyourpower.net. I just watched it again last night, and I recommend you do that. It talks about uh, a lot about the smart meters and the health impacts, and this 4G is called sometimes smart meters on steroids. In that documentary, you'll see Ginger Faber, uh, in which uh, she describes her son's brain cancer death while a student at San Diego State University where there was a huge cell tower. She found a cancer cluster there when she looked into it. So Thank you, I will Carol. provide you copies and would like the Thank doctors you. of the county to sign on. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for your work, Supervisors. My name is Bob Morgan and I'm a constituent in District 1. And I would first like to thank Mr. McPherson for his comments regarding um, community input into the visionary strategic long-term plan for the county. Thank you very much for those uh, previous comments. I'd like to talk a little bit today about trust. Trust in the community that has done good work. Trust in process and trust in a product. And this is what I'm talking about, the county sustainable plan. And this trust now is being sorely tested. This sustainable plan is a wonderful vision and it was produced through 16 community sessions and it was finally publicized in 2014. It took two years to put together and it concerns the whole county. Every district is touched by its reach. It's garnered over 250 pages of congratulatory letters. It's a powerful achievement defining our community vision. Its creation reflects the efforts of a plurality of voices and its forward thinking. Its $500,000 price tag to consultants paid to guide us to its creation has as its first principle, new development should be compact. It should feature a mixture of uses and development intensities that support transportation choices, including transit, cycling, walking, and carpools. It should enhance the unique characteristics of communities by investing in health, healthy, safe, attractive, and walkable neighborhoods. It should promote social connections. This project, on the other hand, the Nissan car dealership now proposed at the corner of 41st and SoCal, SoCal Avenue is a contradiction to the sustainable plan. Let me put that picture forward vertical for you. It is an antithesis to the sustainable plan. This project could be thought of as business as usual. It is the result of a few powerful people pushing their agendas. It engenders, engenders distrust. Its, its objectives are to provide, its first objective is to provide an attractive car dealership. Yes, that's its first objective. To provide ser service commercial zoning where now communi community commercial zoning exists. To provide commercial tax revenue. 
Those objections are a stunning contradiction of the community-driven sustainable plan. The draft DIR produced because constituents in District 1 demanded it be done, and John Leopold saw to it, thank you. This almost didn't get produced. This project was given a negative declaration by planning, and it was gonna be put to the approval of the Board of Supervisors until interested residents and constituents in District 1 held it up. The developer and the owner, Don Cropetti, paid planning staff to complete the draft EIR. It was not put out to bid. He wanted it done now. What's the rush? Staff spent time on the draft when they could have been integrating the sustainable plan and the general plan. Thank you very much, supervisors. Please Thank respect you. the sustainable plan. Thank you. And listen to constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Thank you, Mr. Morgan, for your eloquent um, representation of the public regarding that project. I'm here to talk about the Aptos Village project. And I uh, want to make the public and the supervisors aware that tomorrow is the deadline for the appeal of the building design modifications for phase two. The signs for that um, application were hidden at the construction site. One was behind an outhouse, and the other one was way back in the project where you had to trespass to go see it. There, nowhere on the signs is there anything about the December 22nd close of public comment. I found out happenstance that day, three hours before the comment period was to close. I tried to contact planner Randall Adams, which is the only source of information given on the sign. He was not available. No one from the planning department has been available to provide me with any information on these modification changes until last Thursday after the, the application was approved. I met with Wanda Williams and a couple of other residents as well. She had no information on the project really to answer our questions. She has a list of 12 questions from that meeting. She said she'll try to get us the answers by next Thursday, this Thursday. That will be after the appeal deadline is passed. Now I am considering filing an appeal. I, I could probably scrape together the $800 to go to the zoning administrator, which would be Wanda Williams, and I could probably appeal her decision because I know what her decision will be. She'll wave it on through just like you have on former appeals that I brought where the substantial changes were immense in 2015. I could probably scrape together the $1,200 to appeal it to the Planning Commission, and I might get a better ear there. They might watch the video that I took on December 22nd showing there were no signs available to the public and showing that there were signs placed after the December 22nd appeal comment <clears throat> period ended, put up in a public site at the Trout Gulch. Those were put up after the December 22nd date, and I have that on video. Ms. Williams had not watched that video last week when we met her, and probably nobody would at the ZA. Maybe the Planning Commission would, because they're citizens. Maybe I could scrape together the $1,800 to come before you again, but I know what the result will be. Supervisor friend, you've not answered my emails asking for a community meeting. You have not responded to me going to your constituent hours last week and asking for a community meeting. I came with a letter yesterday. Please. Thank you. If I do not appeal, it will be a conscious you, decision Stein. because I have found another way Thank you. to maybe get a better result than Thank what you, the Stein local Brenner. government Ms. offers Brenner, citizens. Please. Thank you. Please. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, happy new year. Uh, my name is Brenda Chadwick. I've appeared before you many times. I'm an advocate for the, the smaller cannabis cultivators, long-term heritage farmers in, uh, in the county. I know that this is something that you're going to be taking up uh, in the next, I believe, month. Uh, and I wanna encourage you to remember that when this all, started with the C4 committee that the goal was to cast a wide net and bring people in. 
make sure that the black market is eliminated, make sure that there are regulations that uh, our county and, and uh, our community stand behind, uh, no, preservative, no pesticides, organic, safe medicine. Now I know a lot of that has changed, but that's still, I think, the focus that we need to have. Um, the other part is that as I've been following this, there seems to be an emphasis on larger businesses. And I don't really think that works in Santa Cruz County. We're the second smallest county in the state. We need to focus on smaller specialty cottage uh, cultivations. That I think fits more with our community. Uh, during the registration, I think it was halfway through the registration, Governor Brown signed uh, legislation that had been already approved for a type 1C specialty cottage license, which is very small. And for instance, uh, for indoor, it's at up to 500 square feet. I don't know that we need to go up to 500 square feet, but maybe we go up to 200 square feet so that people who have been producing cannabis for our local dispensaries have the opportunity to stay in business. It's something that they do in their home. It would fit in under the home occupation ordinance that the county already has. Um, the other, uh, you know, I, I personally have a 100 square foot garden because I wanted to stay within the guidelines as much as I possibly could. And that 100 square foot garden is half my income. But even though I fall under guidelines for a personal medical garden, I'm not able to sell to the local dispensaries anymore. So I w hope you keep that in mind. I'm gonna keep coming back with it. I think it's very important. I'm excited to see what the um, responses are to the comments that were on the EIR. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I'll see you this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chadwick. Morning. Welcome back. Morning. Uh, Jeff Nordahl, yes, and what she said. I agree with that. Um, so I just want to say that, yeah, I'm speaking about cannabis and just want to let you guys know that I came to this, started interacting with the county, trying to get some clarity, could see it's a complex issue. So I've always been coming at it from a consens consensus point of view and trying to find solutions because I believe there's always solutions if you can actually understand where con different concerned parties are coming from. Uh, the challenge that we're running into, the more people I talk to in the county and try and dig into this issue to understand is, um, just running into, uh, to be frank, and I'm not trying to stick it to the man or anything here, but that my honest uh, experience has been just a lot of concealment, shadowy kind of stuff that is, it, it is not a transparent process that's going on here. Um, so I think it's time to start being honest about some of the things that are going on. Um, one thing I know, just our cannabis licensing head, uh, who is the first licensing person. Um, my understanding and based on conversations is that he resigned for ethical reasons, and that's ethical. Um, he didn't feel comfortable collecting funds from people in the mountains where it, it actually seemed there was actually an effort to actually ban the very people who are paying into the system. Um, so I'm just gonna read really quickly here uh, from the county, the different definitions of zoning. RA, residential agriculture. And it says a use is small scale agriculture, greenhouses and wineries. Uh, I'm gonna read from TP, timber production, growing, harvesting timber, uh, forest products and agriculture. Special use, use is allowed in RA. So those all seem to be in line with what we're proposing as far as cannabis cultivation. Um, uh, Barbara was speaking about the cottage uh, license the state's put forward. That's a 2,500 square feet of uh, outdoor or greenhouse. And just for the fun of it, uh, I have a, 
I just went on GIS this morning um, and pulled up a bunch of parcels in uh, Bonnie Dune, but this actually translates across Coralitas, Aptos, and other areas. Here's one 36 acre parcel in Bonnie Dune. There isn't, it's, it's TP, there isn't one single tree on it, it's all grapes. And I put a little dot on here, that is actually to scale what 2,500 square feet of cannabis would be. And people I know in that region and other places are screaming that forests are gonna be clear cut and such, but right here we have Thank you. vineyards. So anyway, Thank you. Uh, please be fair to this legal Thank you, Mr. agriculture Mr. product. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome back, Mr. Schultz. This is for items not on today's agenda. Uh, hello, sorry for my mistake before. Good morning again, I'm Jack Schultz. I'm here primarily just to show support for, I guess it's item 50. There are new regulations about, uh, I think of it as Airbnb, but um, shared housing. Um, you've done a lot of work on it. I don't really agree with everything in it, but it seems to me like it's, it's the best that we can hope for. Um, so that's really all I'm here to say for, but I think, but I'm take the advantage to say something else. One of the words in there, in the ordinance, is that we grandfather in people. It happens that I benefit from that, I grandfather in. I can be an Airbnb person if I wish. <clears throat> the concept of grandfathering has, it's very difficult. I don't think anyone could easily solve how to judge items of uh, public policy uh, on a merit basis rather than some, some uh, broad-based rule like as of a certain date. Uh, many of you know that I specialize in solving unusual structural problems in water systems, rainfall, and things like that. And I often get calls from people who have been red tagged uh, for various reasons, and usually for darn good reasons. And I often won't take the job because I don't think it should be fixed. Um, but I guess I'm recommending that you somehow form a very independent commission, because it'd be one hell of a difficult job, to consider in things such as Air the Airbnb or planning in general, to consider a commission that somehow evaluates applications on merits rather than on an arbitrary rule of a certain date. I hope you can do that sometime. I know it'll be difficult, but we need to we need to get away from rigid rules because so much is changing. And I think rigidity, even though I happen to benefit from it, is not valuable. Thank you a lot, guys. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Um, again, this is a public comment. Yes, I, thank I, you, thank I, you. For you, I didn't call it oral communications. It's public comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for considering that. I do appreciate your leadership. Um, I want to be able to remind uh, Santa Cruz County residents what it is to be a good flag-waving historic. So this is the flag of 1776, so I want to uh, wave that. But I want to be able to share with members of the public real quick my latest books that I'm reading. Uh, community Justice, really great book, has a plethora of wonderful information just on community justice. I love to read. Also, I'm reading uh, How to Win an Election, right? This is really great because the American public is looking for strong leadership that's going to be really sensitive to the needs uh, of the public. And Aristotle talked about rule will show the man. How we rule shows the individual, right? And I noticed throughout Santa Cruz County, a lot of these political agencies are imposing arbitrary rule, which is shocking, it's just, it just baffling. And we see this arbitrary rule and it frustrates the American public, whether it's a legal community, the DA's office, the sheriff's department, right? Just this arbitrary rule where they just bypass community justice, the due process and equal protection clause, and no one is being above board. All, it seems like everybody wants to protect and chase after the market-driven values. When we constantly relinquish our humanity, for the market-driven values and turn a blind eye to our class struggle, it's bad for all of us. And I want to be able to say to identify with one's neighbor is the beginning of love, right? For the administration of justice is affairs of everyone, <coughs> right? The suffering of a large number of people cannot take place within a society without the impairing of the effectiveness of the whole. Countervailing values sometimes outweigh the obligation to obey democratic laws. Ecclesiastic 7-7 talks about surely oppression destroys a wise man's reason. 
you know, the, the, the rebellion in the jail. I don't appreciate the senator, uh, just nothing but a bought out, shot out newspaper, just throwing uh, the American public. The people in the, in the jail are speaking out. They're tired of the humiliating strip searches that are going on in the jail. They're tired of the inhumane, demoralizing living conditions in the jail. We have to take care of the least of the, uh, the least of the brothers and try to uplift them. They are standing up for their for their humanity, and the social conditions have to improve. We're not asking for for uh, um, we're asking for economic amelioration in the jail so that the people are able to enjoy their humanity. They're rising up and they're standing up. And like I said, it's part of the American public. These are Christians that are not being respected, right? The chaplain needs to be fired. He's not. He's he's just passing. Islamic information, and these are Christians. These are Christian in the county jail, and he doesn't want to provide them with kosher diets. He doesn't want to provide them with Christian Bibles, and it's frustrating because the people find it very hopeless. And when men band together, there's power. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is there anybody else for oral communications, public comment, that'd like to address us on items not on today's agenda? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sandy Clary. And I thought that the hearing for the Airbnb was going to be at 9.30 this morning. Apparently, it's not until 1.30. That's correct. It's a 1.30 scheduled item, and it has been agendized as such since we put the agenda out on Thursday. So does that mean that I would speak at 1.30 yeah. rather than today? Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else for oral communications? Uh, seeing none, we will go on to our regular agenda. Also note that immediately after this item, we will take the board will take a short break in advance of the 1045 uh, scheduled item for Zone 7. So item 50, the first item on our regular agenda is a continued public hearing to consider amendments relating to the accessory dwelling units, including proposed amendments to the county code sections. 12.02.020, and 13.100, and 13.20061107, and 108, and 18.10.104, to accept the CEQA determination and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the planning director. We have a resolution uh, of the submittal to the Coastal Commission, a clean version of the ordinance, a strikeout underline of the proposed coastal ADU ordinance, a clean version of the proposed non-coastal, and a strikeout underline of the proposed non-coastal. The CEQA notice of exemption, the planning commission staff report, and a resolution of the Planning Commission from January 10th, 2018. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you for that um, very thorough introduction. So um, this is a continued public hearing this morning. We, I, we were last here on December 5th discussing this item and your board um, directed staff to return to the Planning Commission for report and recommendation on certain items that had changed uh, since the last reviewed by the Planning Commission for, um, uh, for their discussion. So. Um, I'm going to go through really briefly um, the changes that took place th that um, launched us into returning to the Planning Commission. And additionally, I'm going to take this time now to discuss some of the changes that actually were included in the ordinance when it was before your board on the 5th. Closer to the microphone. I see okay. people trying to Sorry. strain to hear you. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, c when we were here on December 5th, we didn't go into some of the <coughs> changes to site standards that were included in the ordinance that um, was presented because we were focused on the, um, those few coastal issues that had caused us to return, need to return to the Planning Commission. So I'm going to go through all of that in a little bit more detail today so that your board is um, fully brought up to speed on where the ordinance is today. So um, first, I'd just like to um, point out there are two versions of the ordinance, and this is because um, the ordinance amendments that your board adopted in 2017 um, were never reviewed and approved by the Coastal Commission, so they have been in effect since March of 2017 outside of the Coastal Zone. Inside of the Coastal Zone, we have been operating under um, the ADU ordinance as was last approved by the Coastal Commission and is part of our LCP. Um, so we've been operating under two separate ordinances, so we are adopting two different ordinances, and it is our um, deep intention and sincere hope that in a few short months we will have one unified ordinance that is the same throughout the county and in effect everywhere. So um, there are just eight points that I'm going to go through here. Um, 
representing that are you know changes in the ordinance since we last discussed it in detail. Um, the first of those is that there was another change to the state law that was signed into effect in October 2017. Um, one of the substantive changes to those um, state code sections created a different standard for parking, which we are allowed to apply. Um, it eliminated our ability to, uh, to apply parking standards on a poor, per bedroom basis. Rather, we can, uh, we can apply parking standards as um, one space per ADU. That is the maximum we are allowed to um, require. It also included language that um, created parking exemptions for any ADU that is part of the home or other structure. So our interpretation of that is that any ADU that is attached to the primary home that is built above a garage or that is built as um, an addition to another accessory structure on a property would be exempt from the parking requirement. Um, additionally, I'll just also remind you that conversion ADUs, so that is um, ADUs that are created entirely within the walls of an existing structure, have already been exempted from parking requirements per the state law. The one exception to that is that within the Live Oak Parking District, we would continue, or any other future parking district that's established, we would continue to require that property owners provide off-street parking spaces for their ADUs. Um, when we were here, uh, earlier in the spring, we got direction from your board that we eliminate um, one of the site standards addressing the location of an ADU inside the urban area. We used to have a standard that said um, an ADU had to be within 100 feet of the primary dwelling and accessed via the same driveway. We've amended that to say that the ADU can be located anywhere on the parcel and accessed via a second driveway so long as that, is, um, that generates a superior site plan and is approved by the Director of Public Works. Um, now, the two coastal changes that caused us to have to return to the Planning Commission. The first of those is that the prior version of the ordinance stated incorrectly that a conversion ADU would never require a coastal development permit, and in fact, that's an overstatement. There are certain situations in which a conversion ADU would, in fact, meet the definition in the Coastal Act of Development and would require um, a coastal development permit. So we have made that change in the ordinance. The second is the level of review for an ADU to be allowed on commercial agricultural land inside the coastal zone. <clears throat> uh, previous versions of the ordinance um, either did not allow ADUs at all on commercial agriculture inside the coastal zone, um, or uh, the most recent version um, had it at a lower level of review. So outside the coastal zone, we allow ADUs on commercial agricultural land at a level four review, which involves public notice. Um, and the Coastal Commission was not comfortable with that and, and felt that in order to protect those coastal agricultural resources that um, that permit should be elevated to a level five. So um, that is what is shown in the ordinance today. Um, when we were here on December 5th, your board gave us some direction to um, revise the ordinance such that, so that um, one parcel cannot both hold a vacation rental permit and have a legal ADU. So that change has been reflected in the ordinance and that's reflected both in the um, ADU section of the code, which is 1310-681, as well as in the vacation rental section of the code, 1310-694. Um, based on recommendations from the Planning Commission, um, the proposed ordinance that's attached here um, reflects a change to the manner in which height is measured. Uh, you may recall that um, for the last year, we've been operating under a standard of average height outside the coastal zone for certain ADUs, and um, that standard has been a, a bit hard to implement and explain to the public. So we have, um, with the Planning Commission, we are recommending that we remove that average height standard and instead replace it with um, a standard for the exterior wall height that's easier to measure, it's easier to explain and implement. Um, and we think that still addresses the Planning Commission's concerns that, especially in cases where you have an ADU that's built above a garage, um, where the setbacks are reduced to five feet side, side yard and five foot rear yard by the state law, um, they were concerned that there would be um, too much impact on neighbors from having you know, a two-story structure go up so close to a rear yard setback with no notice because these are building permit only. Um, and so they wanted to find some way to mitigate the design and the height of those structures. Um, we think this is a good compromise to um, measure the exterior wall height. And um, at the most recent hearing, they, the Planning Commission voted to recommend um, a 20-foot exterior wall height. 
The prior version of the ordinance included a 22-foot exterior wall height, which um, 22 feet is the exterior wall height that's used for two-story structures in the Pleasure Point Zone District. So we feel that's a standard that has been um, vetted and, and used already somewhere in the community. So um, your board can choose to, to select 22 feet as the exterior wall height or 20 feet as is currently reflected in the ordinance. Um, then just the last two things, some clarifications were added to um, the code about Pleasure Point to address um, that same standard of differences in height and setbacks for ADUs above garages. And then lastly, um, the table in 1310.323 that shows the site and structural dimensions um, has been reformatted to make it easier to read and utilize. So uh, our CEQA exemption was prepared with, in consultation with the environmental coordinator and utilizes the statutory exemption that's available for ordinances about ADUs that flow from um, state government code sections 65852.1 and 65852.2. Um, that notice of exemption is attached to your packet. Um, based on correspondence with the Coastal Commission prior to the December 5th hearing, this, we believe this ordinance is in compliance with the, co with the Coastal Act, and um, our, it is our intention and hope that it will be um, approved by the Coastal Commission when we submit it to them. Our next steps are to, um, following action by your board today, would be to submit the, um, the ordinance as approved or amended by your board, as well as the um, amendment to the general plan and LCP that your board adopted in February of 2017 to the Coastal Commission for their review. And um, our intention is to have that be on the Coastal Commission agenda either in March or April. And so um, the ordinance that is adopted by your board will be in effect outside the coastal zone 30 days after approval. And it will go into effect inside the coastal zone um, immediately upon approval by the Coastal Commission. And at that point we will, um, when we have one unified ordinance, we will be able to launch our public outreach campaign and publish our public guidance documents. So with that, our recommended actions are that your board reopen the continued public hearing on this item, accept the CEQA notice of exemption included as attachment F, adopt the resolution directing staff to submit the ordinance amending the county code inside the coastal zone to the California Coastal Commission, adopt the ordinance amending the county code inside the coastal zone in concept, attachment B, and adopt the ordinance amending the county code outside the coastal zone in concept attachment D and direct the clerk to place the two ordinances for second reading and final approval on your next available agenda. And I am available for any questions should any remain. Thank you for that detailed report. Are there any questions from board members? Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just had uh, two areas that I wanted to talk about. The pleasure point standards. From my reading of this, it it's really has to do with, uh, in the Pleasure Point uh, District, it was uh, allowing, uh, requiring setbacks of those second stories um, uh, that in the, in the area of ADUs, we're not gonna require that. Uh, and then I couldn't exactly t talk about, uh, 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 figure out about the floor area ratio and how that's affected by this all, because one of the, one of the trade-offs that was discussed as part of the Pleasure Point plan was um, you could, uh, if you step back uh, the, the second floor, you could, you could have more space on the first floor and, and, you, and be a, have a higher floor area ratio. So I'm just trying to understand exactly what the difference is that we're proposing here. Um, so the, the proposal that's here right now would add um, an additional 2% of floor area ratio and 2% of lot coverage on parcels that are small, so 6,000 square feet or smaller. Um, if they add an ADU, they would be able to go up to 52% um, or 40 of FAR or 42% of lot coverage. Um, and then in the Pleasure Point Zone District, um, we also added that same 2% to um, the allowable FAR. Um, well, the, the, the lots in Pleasure Point are quite small, right? We don't have, we don't have fixed that 6,000 square foot lots. And um, the community has been supportive of the idea of taking up more of the, sp more of the space on the ground if, if they can reduce the uh, size of the second floor to allow sunlight and other pieces. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to get a sense of what the practical effect of this. If, if these are conversion ADUs, then the, they don't really add to the uh, FAR, 
correct? Correct. Um, and the construction of new ADUs might be challenging there, um, just as some of those lots uh, to get something that really um, m makes sense. But we would, uh, the, but if I understand you correctly, we would, you, they could increase the uh, FAR another two percent. Yes. Um, if they wanted to do it. That's the recommendation. Okay. Um, the second question I had was uh, something that came up well, when we talked about this in December around heights and garage standards. Yes. Um, and so uh, I'm interested in making sure that our garage standards are similar to what we allow for a conversion ADU. Um, and this new uh, way of describing it, not the average height, which I think this is a lot easier to understand and I appreciate um, uh, coming up with something uh, mm -hmm. that's easy to explain. Uh, makes sense, but is that going to be also be the standard for our garages as well? Um, so the, the recommendation that we have right now is that the overall maximum height for detached garages inside the urban services line be lowered to 24 feet to yeah. match, you know, the potential height of an ADU above a garage. Um, as it's currently written, we haven't included the exterior wall height on a detached garage. That's certainly something your board could discuss. So will we do that in this ordinance or will we do it in another ordinance? We would um, we would uh, amend the, the the chart in the code to show that the new case is that there's a maximum height. It wouldn't be in six eight one, which is the ADU section. Yeah, yeah. You but could it, do that today. I, if you we could give you direction. You could give this. us direction. We could we could incorporate that into the final version. That's a that's comes back on the second reading. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm interested in that because I see this as. A, 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 uh, as I explained last time, I'm concerned about people gaming the system, mm -hmm. um, and we should have standards that make sense if we're going to allow, if, if, if it's such an easy path for conversion ADUs, we should make sure that the structures that get built are, are not, we've seen all sorts of interesting ways in which people try to get around right. some of our rules. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. Any other questions from supervisors? Uh, seeing none, we will now take the opportunity to reopen the public hearing. This is an opportunity for you to address us on items regarding the accessory dwelling unit changes. Please feel free to step forward and address us during the public hearing. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. I'm surprised to see an empty room here. Um, I have some concerns, and uh, one of them is that on the um, water requirement for these new um, ADUs versus conversions, that the water agencies are not on the um, county planning's main route checklist. I think that needs to be added. And I've spoken with Ms. Levine about it, but it's a big problem. And I've spoken to, with your board about it. In the SoCal Creek Water District area, they have a water demand offset requirement, not necessarily for the um, the conversions, but for new, they will. And that's not clear to the applicants. That can be corrected by adding the water agencies as part of the main plan routing checklist. It would be a very simple thing and would include the water issues in development. I'd also like to talk about the, um, the ag land, um, having at two different levels of uh, of approval for the coastal and non-coastal, I would like to see both made level five. That would be um, add more consistency and simplicity to the code, and it would also support Measure J, our county's ordinance for preserving farmland and making land taken out of agricultural use more publicly noticed. I would also like to address the issue of using the exterior wall height to, um, to measure the height of an ADU, and I would like to point out that often people put a very high pitched roof and dormer windows, in effect adding to the overall height of the building, and I think it needs to be the overall height to the point of the roof that is considered. I would like to see added in uh, the requirement, a local requirement, that there be fire uh, sprinklers added to all ADUs, and we have the ability to do that because there was a death in an ADU that was not protected for, with fire sprinklers. 
And we all know that a lot of times the heat gets used as a portable heater and those cause fires. That's a simple thing to do and it's a public safety thing to do, to add in the requirement that all ADUs have fire suppression systems. And um, finally, I would like to ask clarification from staff on the shading requirement for new construction. I know there is a, a limitation on December 21st about the amount of shading that proposed construction can impose on neighborhoods, and I would like that Thank made you. clear. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that'd like to address us during the public hearing? Uh, seeing none, we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I really appreciate the work that the staff has done. I know this has been, uh, uh, in some ways, a long 12 months uh, of uh, looking at changes to our accessory dwelling unit uh, regulations. Uh, I believe that there's a lot of support in the community, um, and I'm happy to move the recommended actions. Uh, I, w I want just clarity. Um, because I want to make sure I get this right in the mm. in my motion about the garage standards. Okay. Because I I I I'd like that to be part of the motion, um, but I want to make sure that I, that that I'm giving you the right direction. Okay. So um, the the one the the first thing that um, uh, would be important for that is to clarify whether your board wants to go with the um, ordinance as proposed, which includes a 20 foot exterior wall height versus the 22 foot exterior wall height, which which um, was included the last time uh, the ordinance came to your board. Um, and then you would just direct us to make the, um, the add the standard for exterior wall height to um, the line in 1310-323 about detached garages. Well, so uh, I would move the recommended actions to keep, the, uh, to keep what the unanimous vote of this planning commission was uh, at the 20 foot uh, height Okay. Um, and uh, add these standards to our garage um, um, standards as well. Okay. There's a motion. Is there a second? A second from Supervisor McPherson. Is there additional discussion on this item? Um, I would also like to add my thanks to staff. Um, I think this is a significant step forward in providing uh, often affordable uh, housing options for our county and, and uh, we will now be making it easier, cheaper, and faster to be able to uh, construct ADUs, and I think it has the ability to um, have one of the largest impacts, or fast impacts, uh, on uh, some of our uh, difficult housing options now than uh, any other thing that we've done in the last couple of years. And I think that a lot of it has been because of the work that you've done, and I appreciate you not just working on uh, the state changes, but also bringing forward a set of local changes that really do harmonize with our uh, local values and needs, so I appreciate the staff's work on that. Other, other comments? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. The board will now uh, take a 15-minute break until 1045. We have a 1045 scheduled item, which is the Zone 7 meeting. Uh, we'll return here at 1045. Thank you. like to uh
come back into order, and this time we're actually going to call to order the uh, County of Santa Cruz Board of Directors for the Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 7. If we could have a roll call for Zone 7, please. Director Leopold? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Lynn? Bilicic? Hernandez? DeHart? Ponce? Siri? Here. Gonzalez? Chair Friend? Here. And we do have a quorum with those numbers, and I'll move on to, are there any late additions, Mr. Strudley, to the agenda? Uh, no, there are not. All right, so we'll open it up for oral communications. It's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but within the Zone 7 purview, you'll have three minutes. Uh, good morning, welcome. I could do it much faster in three minutes. <laughs> this is Kay, I'm Kay Archer Bowden, good morning. And uh, I represent the homeowners associations at Pajaro Dunes, and I come to praise your staff today. Uh, on January 8th, the uh, road into Pajaro Dunes flooded and the staff called me in a panic. And by the time I reached Mark, it had, they had already proceeded to stage two of the breaching. Now it's a very complicated process that you have to go through because of the Corps of Engineers permit. Uh, and I was a little concerned because you have all new, you had all new staff this year on Zone 7, and yet they did it just remarkably well. They made it look like it was a really easy thing to do. Um, they responded really quickly. They kept uh, the homeowners at Pajaro Dunes informed of what was going on. They have to send out, I don't know how many emails to how many agencies, but they accomplished that too. So uh, I was just really pleased with the way they responded and the way they communicated with everybody, and I wanted to let you know. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. Is there anybody else that would like to address us during oral communications? Please feel free to step forward. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Um, I would like to ask again that this board, the Flood Control and Water Conservation District, um, extend an invitation to Dr. Helen Dahlke of U University of California, Davis, who's doing some phenomenal work about using stormwater runoff to flood <coughs> farmlands that are um, dormant and doing some excellent groundwater recharge efforts. It's, it's happening a lot in the Central Valley, and I think we could put it to use here in our area, maybe pump some of that water instead of breaching the levee, uh, breaching the, the stormwater runoff to put it out into the fields and let it recharge the aquifer. Dr. Dahlke is doing extensive work on that, and I'd like to invite her and ask you to extend her an invitation to come and speak. We have also another person that I understand is, is actively working in the same respect in the Central Valley, but is local, and his name is Daniel Mountjoy. I would like your board to extend an invitation to come and ask him to give a presentation about his work here as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to address this during oral communications? Good morning, welcome. Good morning, Commissioners. Brian Lockwood, I'm with the Paro Valley Water Management Agency. And I just wanted to um, take a moment of your time during communications this morning and, and um, provide a, a brief update on what we're doing at the Paro Valley Water Management Agency and, and also extend a little uh, praise of staff uh, for the, the great communication and collaboration we've had with the Zone 7 staff in and around this effort. So the uh, Power Valley Water has been working on several proposed projects that are described in our basin management plan. These include a College Lake Integrated Resources Management Project and uh, uh, improvements to our Harkin Slough diversion facility and recharge operations, and then a proposed new point of diversion on Watsonville Slough that would also come with um, recharge operations. And so the, the proposed College Lake project is a little further along. We held a, a community meeting back in July of 2017, and then we held CEQA scoping meetings in December of 2017. And um, Mr. Strudley was there, and we were very grateful for his attendance. Mm -hmm. And we have submitted a water right application to the State Water Resources Control Board for their consideration that um, has been noticed by the State Water Board, and protests can be received through the state through, I believe, it's. Um, March 6th of 2018. 
our staff and our consultants are working to develop a draft environmental impact report, which will be out for public review in the summer of 2018. And it could be available for consideration of certification by December of 2018 or early 2019 if it gets delayed. The work on the Watsonville Slough and Harkins Slough facilities, um, the Harkins Slough is an existing facility that's been operational since 2002. And the Watsonville Slough point of diversion would be a, it's a proposed new diversion on Watsonville Slough. That is about six months behind the effort with College Lake. So we're still um, doing preliminary uh, information gathering. We've completed some subsurface investigations on the San Andreas Terrace to best understand where we can recharge more of the wet, wet winter floodwaters as they flow through the slough system. I do have a couple handouts here. If you would like, I can leave them for you. Um, it's a two-page flyer on the proposed College Lake process. And that's, that's all I have. Maybe from time to time, I'll pop in and provide updates to you as we hit um, key points and milestones. Thank you for your time. If I could, thank you. Thank you. Um, this, since this is an oral communication situation, um, we actually can't respond back to sure. him, but you can follow up individually. Um, thank you for those comments. Is there anybody else that would like to address us during oral communications? Uh, uh, yes, I'd actually like to address the board for oral communications. Mr. Strudley. Um, I'm here on behalf of the County Public Works Department and the, the county's Santa Cruz uh, County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. And I'd like to thank the Board of Supervisors' approval of the consent agenda item this morning, which had to do with a resolution that um, authorizes the Flood Control District to uh, submit a grant to the California Department of Water Resources for enhanced rainfall monitoring equipment. Um, Staff at Zone 7 and the rest of the county is well aware of the sensitive financial constraints of Zone 7 and existing facilities for weather monitoring provided by the National Weather Service literally uh, is under uh, the radar overshoots um, uh, much of Zone 7. And so we hope that uh, uh, with the awardance of this grant that we would have the capability to provide some enhanced flood warning capability and emergency response in zone seven. Um, and uh, we anxiously await to submit that grant application uh, early next week and wait to hear from the Department of Water Resources under their uh, statewide flood emergency response grant. Thank you. Is there anybody else that'd like to address this in oral communications? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to item two, which is the approval of the zone seven minutes. Are there any updates or questions of the minutes? Mr. Siri. <laughs> Do you want to, okay, so just we'll make him present. Is that uh, addition? Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on the minutes? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back for action. I I'll bring you. I'll second. We have a motion from Director Leopold, a second from uh, Director Caput with that change of the minutes that showed that Mr. Sheer was present at the last meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We move on to item three, which is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to consider the nominations of the, for the Zone 7 Board of Directors, Chairperson and Vice Chairperson as recommended from the District Engineer. Mr. Stradley? Yes, thank you. Um, in conformance with the rules and regulations, um, the election of Zone 7 Director, uh, Chairperson, and Vice Chairperson is scheduled for this first regular calendar year meeting. Um, the governance and administration of Zone 7 has been very effective under the incumbent chair. Um, as we move through the final phases of the feasibility uh, stage of the federal flood control project with the Army Corps, uh, we will have numerous additional opportunities for legislative and administrative tasks at the federal and state level. And uh, we respectfully uh, recommend, respect, excuse me, respectfully recommend that the incumbent chair is uh, uh, nominated for chair again this year. And we would also find it very valuable to have representation from the city of Watsonville um, in a nomination for Nancy Bilicic as vice chair. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Is there anybody from the community who'd like to address this before we take action on this item? Uh, are there any other nominations or is there a nomination yeah. for this? I would nominate, I would form, formally nominate uh, Zach Friend as to be continuous chair and Nancy Bilicic as vice chair. Second. <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. 
Uh, we'll move on to item four. As the Board of Directors of Zone 7, consider a status report on storm damage repair and levy rehabilitation assistance as outlined in the memo from the district engineer. We also had the press release sent from the PIO on levy repairs recently. Mr. Stradley. All right, thank you. Um, at the December 5th meeting, uh, Board of Directors requested staff work with the county PIO to update the public on the status of storm damage repairs in the lower Pajaro watershed in Zone 7. Um, that press release was released uh, on December 14th and is attached with this board memo item. Um, we continue to have biweekly phone calls with the Corps um, in understanding their process and encouraging them to move rapidly through their process in addressing the storm damage repairs from last year <coughs> on the Pajaro River and in Salsipuedes Creek. We continue to request that the repairs be made on Salsipuedes Creek first due to its sensitivity to storms um, compared to the Pajaro River. Um, and we expect that um, those repairs to begin in February. What we're told by the Corps is that they're in their contracting process with uh, contractors to conduct the work. Um, we have repeatedly told the Corps that we are eagerly awaiting uh, information from those contractors so that we can approve their uh, specifics of their um, repair process and that they can move forward. Thank you. Are there questions? Sure. Director Caput. Yeah, I actually have pretty much answered what I was going to ask, but uh, when it was scheduled for Fe uh, January, right? And then so it, it got pushed forward to February? Yeah, there have been repeated delays in their process um, despite our biweekly calls with them. So we continue to, to try to encourage them to move rapidly. And our expectation, as we've been told, uh, currently is that they're going to begin these repairs sometime in the month of February. Okay, so basically it'll be, um, uh, it'll help out for next year's probably storm, right? Rather than if we had a big storm now, uh, uh, has anything been done on those 11 different sites or 12 sites? Well, so county staff have provided extra uh, emergency protective measures to those damaged sites on Salpsipoides Creek to continue to provide some protection in the interim until those permanent repairs can be made. Um, large storms would delay the construction process for those repairs. Um, if we don't have large storms, the repairs made in February will, will protect against sure. storms that we could have later this spring as well. You bet. And uh, I, I, real quick, I just want to thank you for how quickly you responded to Pajaro Dunes. Uh, it's uh, we're, it, what the equipment and everything was ready to go, and I mean, it seemed like it was as soon as it uh, flooded in that area that uh, uh, we we responded. The county did immediately. Yeah, that was foresight, uh, just being ready to. What was that based on predictions of weather and everything like that? It was based in part on predictions and a lot on the behavior of what we were seeing with water levels in the lagoon and what features were being inundated. And we responded as quickly as we possibly could to ensure the, the public safety down in the Pajaro Dunes community. And we do have somebody there that was done well and quickly, right? Yeah, thank you. Thanks thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? Is there anybody from the community that would like to address this on this item? Uh, seeing none, it's a consider a status report. Is that an action item that you were requesting just to accept? Yeah, yeah we're just recommending that the board accept and file the report. Okay, we have a motion. We'll moved. A motion from Director Caput, a second from Director Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously, and that will end uh, this Zone 7 meeting. We appreciate, Mr. Siri, you coming up for this. Maybe you'll show up in the minutes this time uh, for being <laughs> present. Uh, but no guarantees until next time. Sure. <laughs> uh, the next item on the board agenda is actually a closed session. Will there be anything reportable coming out of closed session? No. No? Okay. Well, the board will uh, recess into closed session. We have a 1.30 scheduled item back here at the board uh, dealing with the hosted rentals. We will now go into closed session.
item. This is a continued public hearing to consider amendments to the Santa Cruz County Code related to hosted rental uses and adding code section 13.10.690 and amending sections uh, 113.10.312.322.332.335.330.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.331.330.
We would allow a single commercial stay of up to seven days per year without the requirement for a permit, and we would require operators to obtain a transient occupancy tax, TOT tax certificate from the county tax collector and either pay TOT or ensure that TOT is paid on their behalf, such as is the case um, if property owners are only listing their hosted rental through Airbnb, that tax is paid on their behalf. Um, and then I'd just like to mention two other issues that have come up. These have been um, stated in the press in a couple of places, and I've gotten a couple of phone calls, so I feel like there's a little bit of um, unclear information out there. The fee that was established by your board for these applications um, on, on December 12th, the fee for a hosted rental initial permit is $132. The fee that was established for renewal is $198, and that's based on the staff time that would be needed to process those permits. Um, there would be some other you know, fees that, uh, that apply to all of our permits, the general plan fee and the technology fee. But in general, applying for a hosted rental permit would not cost more than $250. Um, I've seen some very high numbers out there in the press, and that's it's not the case. We're, we are doing our best to keep these um, a very low-level permit that's affordable to property owners. And then lastly, um, the question has been raised about whether food service is allowed in hosted rentals, and the ordinance is explicit that food service is permitted in hosted rentals. Um, it, you know, any commercial food service does require under um, the California Retail Food Code and some, some level of inspection or permit from environmental health, and so that would be between the property owner and environmental health to um, sort out what type of um, certificate and inspection they would need for the level of food service they were wanting to provide to their guests. But there's nothing in this code or in um, our policies and planning that would prohibit that from happening. So when we took this uh, proposal to the Planning Commission for discussion at their January 10th public hearing, um, they raised some concerns about um, issuing permits to um, properties that were occupied by tenants. And so um, they asked us to make some changes to the ordinance. Those are shown in um, double underline and strike out as attachment E to this exhibit. Um, if your board shares those concerns, we could insert that language into the ordinance and then um, tenants would no longer be eligible to become hosts after the initial grandfathering period for existing hosts. Um, and, and then those existing tenant hosts would amortize after five years. They would not be eligible to renew their permits. So if that is a concern that your board shares, the language is there and we could insert that into the ordinance. Um, the Planning Commission also uh, directed staff to return to them with a status report on the hosted rental program, either when the total number of permits issued reaches 210 out of 250, or uh, one year after the effective date of the ordinance, whichever comes first. So we'll be reporting back to them about how the, um, how the program is functioning. Regarding CEQA, um, there's been a notice of exemption prepared, and um, that's included with your packet today. Um, as far as Coastal Act compliance goes, the Coastal Commission submitted pretty extensive comments on the December 5th item when we were here before. They, were, um, they had some concerns about limiting the number of nights of operation, and um, it is our understanding from staff that they are more comfortable with an overall limit on the number of permits, and they will be following our check-in with the Planning Commission um, a year from, from the effective date of the ordinance. So our next steps following today's hearing, um, if your board takes a final action today, we, um, we will then be submitting the ordinance to the California Coastal Commission for review. And um, when the Coastal Commission takes their final action, then the ordinance would take effect countywide. And as it's currently written, that would open a 90-day registration period would begin for um, existing hosted rentals to come in and get their first permits. And we would uh, ensure that the registration period is noticed on the county website and publicized through other um, county media resources so that everyone is well aware. We would send email to everyone for whom we have email addresses. We would reach out to Airbnb just to make sure that everyone has plenty of time to submit, um, submit their application and get their initial permit. So with that, our recommendation to your board today is that you reopen the continued public hearing on this item, accept the CEQA notice of exemption, which is attachment D, not attachment E, as it says here in the memo, adopt the resolution directing staff to submit the proposed ordinance to the California Coastal Commission, 
adopt the ordinance amending county code sections 1310, 312, and all the rest of them that we've already read into the record, and creating the code section 1310, 690 regarding hosted rentals in concept, which is included as attachment B, and then direct the clerk to place the ordinance on the next available agenda for its second and final reading. And we are available for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from supervisors before we reopen the hearing? Supervisor Leopold. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, and uh, I appreciate the, the comments th that were made by the Planning Commission. I'm not sure I agree with them, uh, the, all the changes, but, I, uh, but I'm glad that they look at this carefully. I did have a couple questions I wanted to ask. Um, uh, th there is a reference in the staff report and in the analysis about whether someone could apply for both a hosted rental and a vacation or, or and or a vacation rental permit. It seems to me that you would choose, you would choose a, a vacation rental permit or a hosted rental permit, not have both of them. Um, well, so based on the definitions of the two uses, they're different uses. And um, I, I don't see any reason why you, a property owner, why it would be unreasonable for a property owner to want to rent out their entire home sometimes and then also host in one, one or two bedrooms when they are home. So that's based on the definitions that we have of these two uses, that if they wanted to do um, either one of them, they would need a permit for that activity and that the permit for one activity wouldn't authorize them to do the other activity. Yeah, well, uh, my concern, well, I have a couple of concerns around this. One is um, uh, I'm very comfortable in grandfathering people who are, who are using their homes as a hosted rental now. Um, and in places like the Loda, the Live Oak designated area, to count them towards the overall cap, I think that makes sense. And we want to, you know, maintain the residential nature of our residential neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't want it to be a back, and, and so within that there's going to be um, some blocks that have already reached their limit, yes. over their limit, but we might add some new homes in it for, uh, for hosted rentals. Yes. I'm okay with that. But I don't want to turn those hosted rentals into more vacation rentals. Correct. And, I, right. and I'm, I'm, I'm worried that this, I'm worried about two things. One is if we say do both, um, what that, whether we're going, uh, slipping down that slope. And two is I'm concerned that people say I'm going to get a hosted rental, I'm now I'm going to be a hosted rental, but are actually a vacation rental. So you're concerned that people won't comply with their permit conditions? Well, I, I, I'm just, uh, I, I think that we should make people decide whether you're going to be a hosted rental or a vacation rental. Um, and in those blocks where we've already reached the vacation rental permit, we should not be uh, offering any more vacation rental permits. We agree with you on the second point, and we, we'd like to work on some language to add to the code at, at your direction today okay. um, that would clarify that, because that certainly is not our intention to yeah. allow you know, a block that's maxed out to you know, add a vacation rental simply because a hosted rental was grandfathered in. That's not the intention of the ordinance, and, and we agree it could be made more clear that that is not allowed under the ordinance. Um, in terms of allowing you know, some other property anywhere in the county to hold both permits, um, you know, at your board's direction, we can, we can make a change. I don't see any inherent conflict in issuing permits for two different activities on the same parcel. Do you have anything to add, Paya? Um, uh, no, I think that was well stated and that um, the slippery slope is, I mean, that, that's a legitimate thing to think about. We, you know, we, we will um, be providing enforcement, you know, as needed. And if somebody was operating a vacation rental but had a hosted rental permit, that would be a violation. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I say this not because there's probably people in the room who would game the system, but we have had very creative people figure out ways to try to get around some of the limits that we have uh, uh, already have enacted um, around vacation rentals, and I'm, I'm trying to limit that where mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. reasonably. Um, it, it takes me to the second line of questioning, which is do we have reasons to deny someone a permit or a renewal of a permit. Now, I'm, not, I'm, I'm assuming that, that uh, people who come were going to offer permits, uh, but when, in our renewal, that gives us a chance to find out whether there are any problems. Correct. And w do we have something in this ordinance that you feel that if, if they've 
cause noise, if they have abused their parking, if they're really a vacation rental but not a, a, a hosted rental, uh, can we either get a higher level of review or um, do what we do for vacation rentals, which is place them on a probation status or I don't think we've denied anybody a permit for any vacation rental um, here in the county or renewal of a, of a vacation rental. But we have had a, a handful of properties that um, have needed a little bit closer uh, examination. So the language that we have in the code right now regarding renewals mirrors the language that's in the vacation rental ordinance. So um, it does require findings, the development permit findings, and that um, denial of an application for renewal would be based on not being able to make those findings. So um, I believe that sets the structure for what you're referring to. Um, Again, you're, you're correct. To my knowledge, I don't, I don't know of any um, vacation rental permits that have been denied or denied a renewal, but we have this, you know, this provision making them a discretionary action based on findings allows us to um, set other conditions of approval such as, you know, probationary status, returning in one year for another um, review of their application. Sure. So I, I think that those same tools are available here. And again, if you'd like that to be more um, explicit or inherently a higher level of review, that's something that could be discussed. Well, uh, the, the only, uh, what I've learned in, in the course of this is the, the more specificity we offer, it, it's easier for the staff to, to, uh, to make the findings. In our first uh, write-up of the, of the ordinance, we found that the language was, was in some places was a little loose. It actually takes me to my third thing that I want to talk about, which is parking spaces. Okay. Um, so uh, what we're saying in here is that no more than one parking space per room. Um, but uh, in our original writing of the vacation rental ordinance, we said uh, no more than two parking spaces on a street. Well, you know, some streets don't have parking spaces. I mean, they're, you know, they're, I think of in the Pleasure Point neighborhood, parking is at a premium. And so I don't want to assume that because people rent out two rooms that they actually have two parking spaces, because sometimes they don't. Um, yeah. And, uh, and in the review, as, as I've looked over um, issues or heard complaints about our vacation rental permitting program, uh, we did change the language to, to not automatically give people spaces, but assure that they actually have spaces to give. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So um, the, one of the differences is that the vacation rentals um, require plans to be submitted and they're processed at a higher level of review than what we're currently proposing for hosted rentals. Um, the way that we are proposing to regulate parking for hosted rentals is by limiting the number of cars which can be brought to the site by guests. We aren't actually counting parking spaces at all on a property because we aren't looking at plans for these permits. That's part of what keeps the cost down. Um, so, you know, again, there, there are, a, a lot of this program relies on self-policing. That's part of the, um, the, what makes a hosted rental distinct from a vacation rental is that there is a host present on site who lives in the neighborhood and, um, you know, based on public testimony is very invested in the neighborhood. Um, so. This is our recommendation that we, that we view this as more of a performance standard and um, if, you know, there may be places where that's um, insufficient, it's really hard to know right now um, based on what we know about the number of uh, potential hosts in the community. Yeah, um, uh, so uh, I'm just trying to identify issues that have come up in, in the vacation rental program. Yeah. And I may be comfortable with this language, but we will find out over time that w w if, if, that, if that assumptions that mm -hmm. we're making are, in, are inaccurate, that we may need to come back and, and better define that because um, in, the, in heavily impacted uh, neighborhoods, there just isn't parking. I okay. mean, that's the, that becomes a problem. That is something that we can um, specifically look at when we report back to the Planning Commission. We can determine whether we've been having parking complaints about parking impacts at yeah. that point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Supervisor Caput. You bet. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I think I have this right. Uh, $132 for the uh, sign up for a permit license. Yes. Uh, is that for, it, it, that's for a five year period? Yes. One time? Right. Not every year? Okay. Right. And uh, what was the 150 about? Uh
So um, these, the way this, um, the code is currently proposed, we would require that these permits be renewed every five years okay. in order to stay active. Okay. So we have an initial application fee of 132 that your board established, and then the renewal fee is slightly higher based on having to review, you know, um, checking in with the sheriff, checking for any code sure. complaints, and it just involves a little more time. You bet. And uh, with the Coastal Commission, I guess that <clears throat> they could actually draw a line. Uh, one, one neighborhood could actually be okay, and then a neighborhood, another neighborhood might be too close to the, uh, the ocean or whatever. Uh, are they, are they, they're just looking at the property that's in their, in their area, right? Yes, they, when they make comments and when they review, they, they're thinking about the coastal area only. And historically, they normally will say, yeah, they're all okay, or do they ever divide neighborhoods? I'm just curious. They typically comment based on their understanding in general of the coastal zone, and they're interested in visitor accommodation in the coastal zone in general. You bet. Uh, thank you. And then the lastly, um, well, uh, two, two things. Uh, what brought us to this point? Uh, uh, I know we want uh, some money out of it, of the county, but uh, were there complaints about the way it was going for the last, you know, years without any uh, regulation? There had been a lot of unclarity because the code didn't specifically address this circumstance. It addressed other kinds of short-term accommodations, but this is kind of, this is different than a visitor, than a, um, a vacation rental, and it's different than a bed and breakfast. But under the rules that we had previously, um, if one had come in for a permit for this activity, we would have had to call them a bed and breakfast and then go through a higher level discretionary process. And so your board indicated you were interested in a process that more closely matches the level of impact for a hosted rental so it, it's totally different than vacation rentals which brought us to regulate that because there were a lot of complaints about big parties and stuff like that we didn't get that with this the fundamental difference is that with a hosted rental the the um, the host is required yes, to be sir. present during the hosting activity yes. so that there's kind of an inherent check on behavior there and the 250 days that we came up with but 210 is going to be 250 right? permits. 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 We're not permits. regulating nights On of the days, occupancy. Do we have any limits? No. None. Okay. That's uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Supervisor McPherson, then Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah, just to um, clarify, now, who are we grandfathering in? I, I, I'd like to grandfather all those who are hosts right today. Yes. That's, that yes. Correct? That's how it's written now. Okay. And Tenant or before, property owner. Or property owner. Okay. Right. And... Um, and we, we would have a report back on this, and did you say one year? Uh, well, we'll be bringing a report back to the Planning Commission <coughs> in a, a year, either either one year from the date of effective, the effective date of the ordinance, or um, at the point when we have issued 210 out of the 250 permits, we'll be bringing a report to the, a report to the Planning Commission. Okay, so there, there's nothing to do with 250 at this point then? Well, 250 is the cap on permits that, that would be available. So. Um, we believe that the total number of existing hosted rentals in the county is somewhere in the neighborhood of 175. So in that circumstance, if we get 175 folks that come in, they get their, they're established as existing hosted rentals, they get their permits, then we would have you know, another 75 permits to issue to new hosted rentals. And after our initial um, you know, period of bringing folks in under the grandfather clause, then we would be able to start issuing permits for new hosted rentals. However, we don't know exactly how many hosted rentals we have, and maybe we have more than 250. So if we get, you know, 251 people that come in and can prove that they're existing and meet all of our code, we would issue all of those permits and there would be nothing left for new hosted rentals at that point. Okay, because I, I'm pretty sure there's more than 250. I think there's four or five times, maybe more than that, um, out there. Now I don't know. I, I just um, so what? What if a thousand came in? What do you think? Then we would. If they could meet, I mean, the way the code is written today, if they could prove that they've been paying TOT, they could prove they meet all of the standards. It's a legal bedroom. It's attached to the house. The host is present. All the you know meet. They conform with all of our standards. We would issue them permits. That's the way it's written now. Okay. And Thank then you. through attrition, we, you know, we wouldn't issue any permits for new vacation rentals until that number fell below 250. Okay. okay. 
Supervisor Coonerty. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your work. Um, <clears throat> Supervisor Leopold's questions, one of the, uh, it triggered a memory, which I couldn't find in the draft ordinance, which was a requirement that essentially they post, you know, in the photo area and then in the, the other area that it's mm -hmm. a hosted rental permit number X, Y, Z. Um, and is that is that not in the ordinance, in the draft ordinance? Um, I couldn't find it. That 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 do, that is true for vacation rentals. Are you saying you saw it in an earlier hosted rental version? I, no, I remember making that direction at the last meeting oh. um, for the hosted rental. Um, I don't believe that's in here now. So if okay. you'd be willing to rearticulate that, we sure. could do that prior to the. And just to last just meeting. so I just so I understand for the vacation rental, it's where what's the requirement of where it's posted. I think it has to be visible from the street right. because it serves the function of also identifying who the 24-hour co contact no, no, I, I'm is. I'm talking you're, about, you're the, on, the I'm talking about on the website. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Let's on, start over. I'm sorry. On our website? No, on Airbnb. When they advertise? Um, I don't think there's... Other communities have done this. Yes, other it's communities like a photo, have done that. It's in one of the photos and in the, it has to be the first several sentences. Yeah, no, we, we have not, I don't, in neither yeah, of the enough. hosted rental ordinance or the vacation rental ordinance, we don't yes. talk about the requirements for advertising, which would be a, you know, a reasonable thing to talk about. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Council, maybe you have, uh, I, I know that you've worked on this. I can't remember as I sit here if our agreement with just Airbnb has this requirement in it, but I can go get it while you carry on but we don't have agreements with VRBO or any of the other listing agencies and they control the listings. But wouldn't it be, couldn't you put it on the permit holder that in their listing they have to do this? But typically the permit holders are using these platforms that they don't control, like VRBO and Airbnb. But they, but they post photos, so this would be a photo that they post. That you could do. Yeah, that, that's that's what all I mean is that they in the the series of photos you show to your place that one of the photos be, you know, hosted rental permit number X, and then in the in the you know first four sentences of the description, this is a this this is a hosted rental permit X. You know, to X the extent reason. the permit holder can control that level of what goes up on these websites that they don't control, I think that you're within your, okay. it's within your jurisdiction to do that. I'm gonna go get the Airbnb agreement and see if it requires this because I can't recall. Okay, thank you. Can I get a sense of how many people are interested in speaking to this item just so I can know how long we'll have to do? Okay, um, so we're gonna reopen the public hearing. If you could line up, that'd be, uh, that'd help expedite things. We'll have two minutes for each <laughs> comment on this item. Um, I appreciate everybody coming back today on our scheduled item. I appreciate your willingness to speak again. <laughs> Just state your name and uh, go ahead. You'll have two minutes. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Kitty Marachi. Um, as a volunteer for Save Our Shores, I learned the uh, importance of training people, teaching people about nature so that they help provide, um, they help preserve it. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has put out a request to the coastal counties in California to increase the amount of camping available to the public. Because when people experience nature firsthand, they're much more likely to support its preservation. And you know that camping in Santa Cruz is very limited. But Airbnb has provided a way for people, especially people who live in the Bay Area, to be able to camp here, to stay out in nature, and to really de-stress and experience the wonders that we have to offer. And I think you'd probably rather have them visit here than to move here. <laughs> um, most of the guests that, uh, that are out, that uh, come visit these places that are out in nature are from the Silicon Valley or from San Francisco area. And so they don't come here, you know, just to hang out for a day uh, if they have to stay in a hotel. But when they have a place out in nature, they tend to stay longer and they spend a lot more money. These type of listings are actually the most popular on Airbnb, so it's a little disturbing to me that you are completely uh, removing them from the entire possibility uh, for people to stay there. 
Um, I did a little search last night, um, quick search, and I found over 50 listings just in Aptos and SoCal rural areas that are of that nature, that would not be counted as a you know, technical hosted rental, even though they are rented by the people who live right there and they, people, the guests are overseen by the hosts. Uh, if you shut us down, it'll have a huge financial impact on the county. I've ha hosted over 3,500 guests. Thank you. And Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, this is Nick. Thank you for allowing me to, to speak. Um, I'm actually interested, but I listened to this lady's, this lady's comments, and it's, I've got a great follow-up question, actually. It was exactly the same kind of comment. Um, do your, your, your rules and regulations, that we understand, they're going to affect the whole county, not just Santa Cruz city limits? Um, if you could just, just keep with your okay. testimony, we'll answer. Um, well, what the lady before me was just saying was true. I mean, there are some truly unique and interesting properties all over the world. I mean, California, this area, that, that attract discerning travelers with money. They don't want to stay in, in dive motels on Ocean Street, on Ocean Street that are 200 bucks a night. Um, I mean, I, I think it's such a shame that you would restrict yurts or vintage trailers or other dwellings in the Santa Cruz Mountains or other parts of this state. I mean, it, it's, it's just a travesty because there's so many unique and interesting, in, interesting people to meet and there's travelers and we're living in a new paradigm. I mean, people don't want to stay in some of, some of these, these motels. I mean, you're, you're restricting people. I think, it's, I think it's a shame. And I would urge you to, yes, we need to clamp down on these Airbnb type hotels, like a mini hotel, we, no one wants that. No one wants to live next to a house that was once a, once a dwelling and it's now become a hotel. But what on earth is wrong with somebody who's got an acre, 10 acres, 100 acres in Bonny Doon or, or somewhere having a yurt or a, or a camper? I mean, I, I, can you exp address what would be the issue with that? I, I can't understand it. It just seems punitive. It seems regressive. I don't know if you ever used Airbnb, but they're all over the world. I mean, I've stayed in them. I've met f amazing people. Um, I, I'm just shocked at your regulations. I mean, I can totally understand why you want to restrict housing and noise, but I think you've overreached. And I would love for you to reconsider people using their properties, particularly in the outlying areas. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just a point of clarification, these regulations only apply to the unincorporated area, not the cities. That's where our jurisdiction is. Good afternoon, sir. Un unincorporated only, yes. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Welcome back. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my supervisor, John Leopold, and also the board for uh, listening to me here today and on previous occasions, too. Uh, just an answer to Greg uh, Coppett's uh, question. Uh, it's my understanding from everyone involved in this, including the Planning Com Commission, which it hasn't been uh, particularly favorable to any of this, that uh, none of this is complaint driven. Uh, that's because um, the uh, fact that they're hosted rentals uh, it makes it uh, self-regulated, very well regulated because this has been going on for m many years with no complaints a well-regulated uh, system. But uh, despite the fact that I, I, I think this interferes with personal property rights, uh, I'll set that aside. Um, there seems to be a problem that the county doesn't understand. There are two different uh, areas of the county, the heavily impacted areas and everyone else. Um, parking is not an issue in my neighborhood. Uh, I can put two, three cars in my driveway uh, with no problem. Um, I, I think uh, there could be a way to look at things differently if we separate uh, the, the those sections of the county from the heavily impacted areas. Uh, just before my time runs out, I, I also uh, think the 250 permits is arbitrary. It's not clear, and it, I don't think anyone uh, in front of me here is clear on whether if there are 500 people that are going to be grandfathered in, but there are only 250 permits, what does that mean? Um, are we talking about 250 permits uh, in addition to everyone that's going to be grandfathered in? And um, uh, I uh, just would like to see no Thank limits you. on uh, permits. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you. 
My name is Georgina Monaghan. I live in Live Oak. And I'd like to ask you to reconsider um, the part of the ordinance that uh, combines the vacation rentals and the hosted rentals uh, to um, determine whether or not the 20% in a neighborhood has been met. I live in a cul-de-sac, and there are eight houses in the cul-de-sac. I'm the only person who lives there full time. The other homes, four of, or four of them rarely see the owners, and the others, three, people come and go during the month because all of these people have another house somewhere else that they go to. I find that now, at this stage of my life, I'd like to make a little extra money. So I thought, well, Airbnb is probably a good idea for me, but it's not going to work for me. There's already one vacation rental on the cul-de-sac. Last year, there were two, and I don't know if that second person has asked for a renewal. Therefore, I'm out of luck, and um, I feel that my effort would be have very little impact on the cul-de-sac. And um, it just doesn't seem quite right. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Mark Leach. I'm in the Seacliff area. And thanks a lot for your corresponding with me. Um, to address Supervisor Coonerty's suggestion about uh, taking a photo and putting it in the, in the photo area of an Airbnb, if we do that, make sure that the address of the property is not next to that number, because you don't want a picture of the address before somebody rents a place. Also, um, this might sound a little bit wacky, but then I, I know you can't do performance standards for people who get permits, but what would you do for somebody who bought a permit but didn't rent it out? They got a permit because they don't want, they want to max out the number of permits that are available in their location. And it might sound weird, but I know somebody that is interested in doing that because they don't want they, they don't want more Airbnb or you know short-term rentals in in their neighborhood, so that could be a problem. I don't know if it would, but you know, do you? What would we see if someone has a permit and how many how many times did they rent it that year? If they if they didn't rent it at all, what would you do if you needed to do anything? So that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. The ordinance actually addresses exactly that. It requires there to be a, a minimum level of usage of the permit in order for it to be considered valid, so that was addressed. Yeah, people are actually already doing that in the, in the designated areas, and so we d developed a standard that they actually have to show that they rented it out three out of the five years uh, that they've had the permit. Thank you. Sir, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fred Kohler. I'm in Mr. McPherson's district. Um, I'd like to address a couple of things. One is I support relaxing this ordinance to include yurts and tents and vintage trailers and that kind of thing, because I don't think that the extending the uh, permit process to these structures are going to impact uh, availability of permanent housing. Without a kitchen, an ADU is just a bedroom. It just doesn't have to be, it isn't attached. Um, the other issue that I want to uh, bring up to you, and I may be late to the party on on this sort of thing, but part of the the uh, um, the regulations say that that the bedroom must be a legal bedroom, so that's meaning that it has a permit. You're probably aware there's lots of structures in Santa Cruz that don't have permits, and and I know that the planning department is working on modernizing the code process. And part of that process would be to allow legal occupancy for non-permitted structures with a health and safety inspection. And so, what I'd like to propose is that the uh, regulation for uh, for the for permits um, would you know, change that legal bedroom to something like a, 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 you know, a legally occupiable bedroom or something like that that would, that would cover both permits and the LEAP um, thing that's coming up, the, the limited immunity amnesty program. And so later when that program becomes effective, if the words say legal bedroom, then it wouldn't apply. So I'd really like to see that changed. I'm sure county council would have an opinion on what kind of words would include both the app and a permitted structure. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, welcome. 
Good afternoon. Pascal Broca, I live in Borny Dune. Um, I mostly, I live close to UCSC, so I mostly rent at the beginning of the quarter to students who don't have lodging yet, so they come to my place for a short period of time. At the end of the quarter, I rent to students who are out of time, uh, far away, but they, they have, um, you know, exams and, and they come to my place to stay there, close to campus, and I also rent to parents coming for their graduation. Uh, there is no parking problems in the countryside. I live in Barney Dune. Um, the impact on the neighborhood is very positive. I think that I'm doing something good for the community. Um, I am thinking of expanding and having a, a third bedroom. Right now I have two. Um, but that means that I would be out of this regulation. So that's a problem for me and that's a problem for the students and the parents. They, I would like them to be able to come to see their kids graduate and have as many cars as they want. There's plenty of space. So I think we need to make a difference between a location like Bonny Dune and um, a coastal area more dense. Then um, I want to react on uh, Greg's point about what brought us to this point. Um, currently, the system is a win-win because uh, we are, it's an easy system for us as owners, and then we get the TOT for the county. Now, this proposal will lead to a reduction in the TOT, and so I would like to ask you the question, have you calculated how much money we're going to lose because we're going to shrink the tax base by, by putting in place this proposal right now? My belief is that we should try to broaden and expand the tax base and try to include as many people. And it's a very easy system right now. Airbnb pays TOT. Now, if we say, oh, you cannot have a tree house um, or an RV or something, then it means that those people would be forced underground and then we will have a loss of revenue for the TOT. So I would like to know how much money are you ready to lose for this? And, and why, what brought us here? Why don't we make a win-win so that we both win? Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Supervisors. Supervisor Friend, I'm hoping you'll give me slightly more than two minutes because I'm being two people. Two, I just got to <laughs> keep it to two. I'm sorry to make sure that everybody gets a chance. Well, let's restart the clock, though, make sure okay. it gets full, too. Thank you. Um, first, I'm pretending that I'm Patty Amarenti because she couldn't be here today, and I said I would. She's concerned about the Planning Commission recommendation that tenants not be allowed to renew their permits. Um, Tenants in California law have what's called full possessory rights, which means the same right to quiet enjoyment of their rental properties as owners. She believes it's a violation of tenants' rights to discriminate against tenants uh, when they come up for renewal. And she says, doesn't this make a complete mockery of the original reason for this ordinance, which is to help maintain more affordable housing? Why then, after a short period of time, take away a tenant's ability to make their rentals affordable by hosting? Now, speaking for myself, Nancy Kelly, um, I think Patty's point about making a mockery of the original purpose of this ordinance, which we were told was to help maintain affordable housing, is such a good one. Under this proposed ordinance, fully two-thirds of the people currently using Airbnb to supplement their income will lose their right to do so. Why? Because their room over a detached garage or a slightly detached guest room, neither of which has a kitchen and therefore could never become a long-term rental, are not bedrooms within their homes. So many of these Airbnb spaces are in rural areas where parcel size makes concerns about the number of cars and neighborhood impact silly. Why must these people be denied a way to make their property affordable? These alternative structures are still part of their home space. They still monitor guests because the guests are at their house, just not within their four walls. Can't this intelligent and concerned board come up with a way of helping these people so that it also lets them continue to contribute the approximately $1 million the county stands to lose in TOT income, money which benefits the entire county if these units are forced to go away? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Good afternoon, welcome. Hi, my name is Kathy Cress, and I've acted as the um, the uh, head of this group for um, 
the entire time, or not half the time. I want to tell you thank you so much for all of you being so open to con uh, communicating with us, for meeting individually. I think in many ways changing your opinions by listening to us. And I think as many people said and I said in my letter, I was so grateful that I saw government uh, acting in the way that I want government to act and that you have open communication. Um, I think what we have here is uh, two things about the unaffordable, the, the Dragonian unaffordability of California. One is obviously what you see here are a lot of seniors who don't have defined pensions again and a lot of young people who bought houses and can't afford to keep them. And the second thing is, as the Coastal Commission pointed out, you have people who are, can afford to come to uh, the shore, as I used to call it, New Jersey, uh, and not be in the top 10%. So thank you very much, and I hope we can continue to have a dialogue with you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Yeah, hi, I'm Brian Sanford of Felton. Uh, I think I'll be really brief because I think I heard something that addressed my concern. I, uh, Super Supervisor Friend, I remember the last time when you, we put up your written uh, proposal of how to modify the ordinance, there was a statement I noticed about it only allowing one parking spot per unit if I read it properly. Uh, maybe I didn't. But uh, am I to understand, I, this turns into partially a question, I just want to make sure as someone lives in an corporate area where I have parking for four plus cars on my property. Uh, I think I heard someone say earlier today that would, the current ordinance reads that it would be one parking space allotment per room. That's Thank correct. you. That's what I want to know. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Roger Powell. I live in Felton. And I'm a tenant. And um, it sounds like I'll be phased out after five years. Uh, so that, that's, what, that's my, my main concern. Um, I've, I've, been, I've been paying my um, taxes. Um, for, I've been, been doing the Airbnb hosted for, for a, a, about four years now. And it sounds like with the new thing, I'll be phased out after five years. I, I, I've been a family owned home, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm never going to actually own it, but I'll. Um, you know, that, that's my concern is being phased out. Thank you. As a tenant. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hello. Uh, I'm Susan Howe, uh, Zach Friend. Thank you for being our supervisor and all of you. Um, I've spoken before. The main reason that we're doing this, my husband and myself, is financial for a short period of time. So after five years, someone else can do, can have my permit. I have no intention of renting it out to anyone after that purpose. Um, we could have 10 cars in our driveway. When I do open studio, I can have 20 cars. When you live out in the hills, you have a lot of space for alternate methods of inviting people to come enjoy our county. And that's what we've been doing, and we've been enjoying it. Um, I would also just like to say at the end, I don't know why we even had to do this to begin with. Um, Supervisor Caput brought it up. Um, I think we've all gone through and proved to you, I hope, and to anyone I know, that we should be unlimited in the number of people with a reasonable permit that can do Airbnb, especially out in the hills and places that don't impact the coastal community directly. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you. I'm Susan Simaretti, and I'd like to thank each and every one of you for allowing us to uh, speak to this um, to this uh, concern. Um, thank you for grandfathering all of us in. I really, really appreciate that. And one of my concern is the um, certificate. Uh, again, I agree with the gentleman not to have our address on there. We're happy to have the number or whatever, but not the address. We don't give our address out until actually the the um, the guest has uh, agreed to stay and and has gone through Airbnb. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Good afternoon, Brenda Chadwick. Um, I'd like to comment on the alternative. Uh, 
sites, uh, anything like a yurt or a trailer. <coughs> you know, a lot of people don't want to come and stay in a sterile hotel in uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, being able to be in the redwoods or near uh, flowing water, to me that seems, um, you know, I'd much rather do something like that than stay at a hotel. So I'm, I, I, I definitely don't agree that that should be excluded if you're really just talking about the space of a room and there's no other facilities there for that. Um, I'd like to congratulate the board and the county for uh, having the heart to grandfather all of these people in. Um, I myself am a senior. Um, I happen to use my home for a, a small cannabis cultivation. No such consideration was given for us. I, and, um, you know, I, th I think the group here is, is pretty lucky. Uh, hopefully, as time goes on, uh, there will be a new ordinance related to the legal cannabis that's allowed here in the state and the county. And my hope is that you look at it uh, and consider, because we are such a small county geographically, let's look at ways that we can have smaller cultivation sites allow people to use the investment that they've made in their home to supplement their income. I'm in the same place. I have a very limited amount of um, money coming in and uh, growing a small amount of cannabis this is what's kept me and my husband in our house for the past eight years. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. And uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak to you. I'm Peter Shudlovsky. I've been a resident of uh, the first district since I moved here in 1976. And uh, I've chosen to have relatively low paying jobs in my career uh, because I like to walk. So I was paid as a mailman in the lower ocean district and as a park ranger at Pinnacles National, now park. Um, but my income is relatively low because of that, my pension, my social security, but that's okay. Uh, but I have had to supplement income by renting out rooms in my home, which is just outside of the Loda. Um, uh, but by doing so, uh, my, uh, my, with my wife and I, five children and six grandchildren, they, they had no place to stay with us because our rooms were rented out. Uh, Airbnb came along uh, in our lives three years ago and it's been a, uh, a blessing. Uh, because now we can block out rooms anytime we want and kids and grandkids can come and stay with us and enjoy the, the beach not too far away. So I, I thank you for having made some shift in your attitude towards Airbnb and uh, enable our family life to continue and we've contributed a lot in TOT to the county's operation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Hello, my name is Ed Borowick, and I'd like to uh, thank you guys for, uh, for making the permit process reasonable, because otherwise it would blow us out of the water. As you know, most, mostly everybody here is actually supporting their ability to live in Santa Cruz in the houses that we owned here for so many years. The only thing that concerned me in this, this, this one is why limit the number of permits? Uh, you know, I mean, do you want to, do you have to get your hands in every single control of everything? Uh, it'll probably be self-controlling. Airbnb is self-controlling because we comment on our guests and our guests comment on us and how our places are and how they look and stuff. So thank you very much for being reasonable. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome back. Hi, my name is Janice Rodriguez and I'm a realtor here in Santa Cruz. I also am a vacation rental manager. I have relationships with both hosted and non-hosted owners. I was reading the proposed ordinance and have two concerns. One is combining the hosted, non-hosted and designated areas. There are two different types of rentals completely, um, as you know, and you've made accommodations regarding them in other areas of the ordinance, and I don't understand why it can't be the same regarding the designated areas, because the host is present in those. So I think you'd really be limiting people who can or need you know, to host on site. And the other thing is not including rooms outside of the home, like above a garage. I, I know someone who's a retired teacher, and she'd be devastated if she had to stop doing 
what she's doing because it's helping her income. So, and it's just above the garage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, you can only uh, testify once. Just once? Only yes. once, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there anybody else that would like to address us during this public hearing? Uh, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back. One, one, oh, I'm one. sorry. Is there somebody coming? Please. We're going to not close the public hearing. We're keeping it open for this last speaker. All right, my printer was on the blink, and I'm struggling with my, <clears throat> my laptop. My name is Sharon Himmelsbach, and um, I supervise a friend. I'm, I'm in the Rio Del Mar district of the coastal zone. Um, I really appreciate your time today, everybody, and it's been a privilege and pretty exciting to be part of the democratic process that, that you know, we've seen in this, this whole um, situation. So I, I'm a pr really grateful to be here. Um, I, uh, I attended UCSC as a reentry student and I've lived here for 24 years. I have really deep roots in the community. Um, I've done over a thousand hours of volunteer work here with rehab and um, um, uh, recovery centers, as well as teaching um, meditation and pain management to other people with chronic illness and chronic pain like me. And I have been permanently disabled since 2001. I used to make a good income in high tech, but um, that went away when I was told I'd never work again and Airbnb is allowing me to stay here. Um, so what I'm most concerned about is that um, I was a renter for about 20 of the 24 years that I've lived here. It's almost a fluke and, and a lot of hard work and savings that I have a home, but it wouldn't take much for me to lose that home and become a renter again. And if that happens, probably the only way I could stay here would be to continue as a hosted renter, um, get a lease, get three bedrooms, and what would happen is I'd have one, you know, subletter permanent resident and one hosted rental room. Um, I really want you to think, um, consider that in our society, it's axiomatic, the more money you have, the more power you have, and the more political voice you have. And I think this is a chance for us to reverse that and say that renters who generally have less money um, deserve Thank just you. as much, um, just as many rights Thank as you. the homeowners. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to address this in the public hearing? All right, then we are now going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. Supervisor Coonerty. Sure. Uh, well, before, sorry. Uh, before I make a motion, I'd like to uh, just ask a question. There was questions about camping, yurts, RVs, tree houses. Um, can you discuss that? Um, uh, using RVs as a first example, there are um, um, other rules in there. You're not allowed to sleep or use an RV as an external bedroom in general terms. So um, it would be yet more different to allow that as a, the use as a hosted rental. And in fact, we'd have to come up with some scheme to allow them in the first place in order for that. And um, um, tree houses. Um, yurts, other vehicles, um, those are all things that right now don't get building permits as dwelling units and so we haven't gone through the process of building inspection and vetting and whatever notice there is in a community to create, excuse me, to create a dwelling unit. So um, um, those processes would, would need to happen or we'd need to change at many other parts of the code to make that possible. It wouldn't be just a change to the hosted rental ordinance and it'd be a big departure. Probably also the general plan. And the general plan as well. Okay. Um, the second question is to, for County Council about this question about if it's permitted bedrooms versus bedrooms that are somehow legalized. So the ordinance doesn't use the term permitted. The ordinance uses the term legal. Um, so I think, you know, we would need to look at how that intersects with the LIAP program to determine whether a particular bedroom is legal. Um, but I think it's of note that the, it doesn't use the term permitted. Okay. Um, so in that case, uh, I'd like to move the staff recommendation uh, with the f additional directions. And just for clarity, so the staff recommendation does not include the Planning Commission's limits on rentals. So the renters would be able to participate in this 
uh, and wouldn't have a sunset. Um, <clears throat> with the additional direction of the clarity, giving you the opportunity to create the clarity around this caps issue, around the cap issue, and how the the two interact, um, I am interested in having those uh, hosted rentals count towards the cap. Okay. Uh, and I'm okay with people having two different permits, but I don't want to create the loophole that, that Supervisor Leopold was talking about is the direction um, I want to go. And then the additional direction of having um, hosted uh, rental and a permit number in a photo and in a text. So it doesn't have to be a literal picture of somebody's permit. It has to just say hosted rental with a permit number, Santa Cruz County hosted rental permit number um, in the in both the description of the of the site and in, in the, the in the photo. Okay. So we have a motion with some additional direction. I'll second the motion. Is there additional discussion on this item? Yeah, I'm. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. <laughs> I'm concerned about the cap. I just think there, as I stated in the earlier discussion that we had uh, a month ago, <clears throat> uh, I think there's some hosted rentals that have been taking place without paying the TOT, and um, that's too bad. And so I don't want to, um, you know, let them go, so to speak. But on the other hand, I think a reality check. Uh, is that there's going to be many more than 250, and I know we're going to go up and then come down to that number, possibly. But I, um, I'm really bothered that um, we're, there's going to be a lot of people that have been doing hosted rentals uh, that should have been paving taxes, maybe and didn't. But I'd like to see them uh, know that this is a new ball game, and that uh, if you want to have a hosted rental, you're going to have to start paying the TOT. And um, so I, that's why I would like to uh, allow this to expand uh, to uh, anybody who has been doing this, and even if they w had not been paying the TOT, uh, to be allowed that opportunity to get into the game at this point. Um, it's not usually the way I like to do things, but I think the reality of it is this is going to have a tremendous impact on a lot of people in this county. Uh, that uh, would pay the TOT if they were allowed the opportunity, and I think it's going to be a lot more than the, the, the 250 that we're going to get to in the long run. So I, I'm going to have a problem with the motion, probably. Ms. McRae, did you want to add something to this? Thank you. Our agreement with Airbnb currently has Airbnb as the TOT certificate holder, not the individual property owners. Therefore, Airbnb pays based on geography. So whether or not anybody who is running a hosted rental has a certificate for TOT, it doesn't matter because we are getting, based on the, the map that Airbnb has that we audit twice a year, we are collecting the TOT from current hosted rentals ever since our agreement with Airbnb went into effect. I, uh, it's a different answer for any other platform, but for Airbnb, we are getting that money. And if, if I could just add an, an additional clarification, the ordinance as it's currently written would allow anyone who had been um, conducting hosted rental activity without advertising on Airbnb and therefore play, paying TOT and without paying TOT on their own, it would allow them to retroactively make TOT payments if they can show, if they have other means of sh proving activity, rental activity, and we would then allow them to register as an existing. This is what would happen when we, when we first had our vacation rental ordinance. So we said if, if you can show activity, um, we're, we're going to believe you. Right, come in and um, pay your taxes and then yeah. you can register. And we did ask them to come, that when they came in and said, well, I don't have way, then we, I think uh, the then uh, treasurer tax collectors said, Make an estimate of what you think you sh should be in the TOT, and um, and and it, that was so. It was pretty inclusive, I would say. Um, it, it, ma it made it available for lots of people, um, and I don't. Th I, and I didn't hear any stories of people who were felt like they had been a vacation rental and then weren't able to be grandfathered in. Everybody was. Uh, well, Supervisor Leopold, then Supervisor Caput. Yeah, so I have a couple uh, uh, different thoughts. Um, 
Uh, one is, uh, I, I do think that we should, people should choose to be either a hosted rental or a vacation rental. Okay. Um, and that, that, um, uh, that after some period of time, we might want to take a look at that, but, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, this idea that people could have two and then how does that count towards the <coughs> perm, you know, if, uh, how does that count towards the cat? It, it's just, it, it, it does get, uh, it does it, it enter a level of complication. So people should choose one or the other, is my sense. Um, and I'm comfortable with uh, the grandfathering in, as I just explained, I think that this is a this is a big door to walk in, and people should be able to to make their case. And at least past experience with the planning department has shown me that the planning department is willing to accept many different ways in which uh, people can make that case. And it, and and so it's not just limited to show me a tax receipt or uh, or something else. Uh, so I feel comfortable with that. I, I would say as a, uh, as, an, as a cautionary note, on the questions of uh, parking numbers and things like that, that will be really be um, as we see over time whether we need to, to, to tighten that in some way or another. I'm comfortable leaving in the language the way it is, but, uh, but that'd be one of the things that I'll be, I'll be looking for in future, as we look at this in the future. Um, I do... Uh, there are two parts of this ordinance that uh, I haven't really been able to define as, as um, I don't understand the policy goal necessarily of, which is the requirement that hosted rentals have to renew every five years um, because uh, I don't understand the distinction between that and a vacation rental. If you're, if you're in Bonnie Dune, and you uh, and you have a vacation rental home, you have a you you've applied for your vacation rental permit, and it's it's an entitlement with your land forever. Um, and if you live in the Live Oak designated area, then you have a five year limit because we have these caps, and we want to make sure that there's turnover. So I, I, that that makes sense to me. I understand that. But to have all hosted rentals have a five year you know, that part doesn't make sense to me. I, I could see, in, the, in again, in the designated areas, um, and I'd be curious to hear from my colleagues if there's, if there's something I'm missing there. Um, the other part uh, is the arbitrariness of the 250 uh, number. Uh, I don't know how many um, uh, hosted rentals there are. We've heard lots of different numbers, um, and the past experience uh, with vacation rentals is we kind of had an idea, but it was a little bit more than we thought uh, when, the, the, when the time came in. And so it wouldn't surprise me that, m that more, more than 175 show up. And at least as I understand this, is that if 500 um, permit requests came in in those first 90 days, we would honor every single one of them, and it would only be after that 90-day period that uh, of that that window, that uh, that we'd be facing the limits, um, but I just I don't uh, again I'm not sure what the policy goal is of the 250, um, and so I just uh, I just question why whether we need it, um, and I'd be curious f from my uh, my colleagues or anyone about those two pieces why the five year for everybody and why the the 250 because because it's just. That's, that's, the, that's the part that is the hardest to understand in this. Well, I'm supportive as the motion as it is, only just uh, the five year, even in the previous staff report, was really an opportunity for check-in. One of the questions that you had raised uh, was in regards to renewal and whether if people had issues, what would be that process and a check-in and, and five years provided that check-in. Five years in discussions with the hosts they didn't want a one year, which was the original recommendation, they wanted it spread out, and they wanted it to be inexpensive. So we met those two policy requests from the community on that. I think a five year check in is not an unreasonable uh, thing. Um, if you, I, I mean, one of the discussions we can have moving forward is whether uh, the vacation rental ordinance under its current construct is meeting all of our uh, goals or whether certain elements should be broadened out beyond just the designated zones including on the check-in. Uh, as I had mentioned at the last meeting in regards to the cap, um, 
you know, we do have a pretty decent or best possible estimate, not just through Airbnb, but through uh, the site that does the aggregation to try and determine uh, other platforms as well, not to mention our work with the auditor, controller, tax collector to determine how many TOT uh, permits that there were, uh, which is we believed uh, that this allowed for some growth. If it exceeds it, I think that one of the, the realities of this board in general is that we've, uh, in different elements in the last couple of years, we've tried to um, create a regulatory framework, determine whether it's uh, too restrictive, and if it is, then we're, we've always been willing to come back and take another look at it. Um, as the Planning Commission, by the way, seems to be looking exactly to do uh, once it meets a certain component. And I think that the best way to check in on this, including some of the concerns you have around the parking element, uh, would be to just have uh, you know, report back or a check-in at a designated time, and if the board at that time feels that there have been no issues associated with the number of permits that we've issued, uh, in fact, to the point where we feel that this is should be expanded, I think that's a proper time to do it. I don't think uh, on the front end it makes sense to just have no backstop at all, and uh, that's why we're just trying to be as reasonable as possible. And I, and, and I appreciated some of the comments that were made today that acknowledge that the board has come a really long way uh, in a year from the original uh, design heard what the community said to meet these needs, and, uh, and I think that that's the, the, the ordinance we have does that, and if we need to come back and check in, I, I'm completely open to doing that in a, in a set time. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I, um, I think I can see where this is going, but uh, so if we have this 90-day window, so to speak, um, certainly I'd like to have a, a response, and then we can react to that when, when it comes to us. Um, but I, for when would when would be the right time? If it's 90 days, we're going to get into uh, May or something, and we're getting into some tight budget discussions. Type thing. Well, we have to go through the Coastal Commission as well. Yeah. So I mean, so, so we got. Be, it would probably be in the fall, realistically, that we would be. Um, when, back. when the 90-day window would be closing. Mm-hmm. Um, it would probably my my best guess on based on. Um, optimistic timelines would be late summer, um, probably more realistic timeline is fall to next winter. When because the 90 if the Coastal would be Commission closing. makes changes and it has to come back, yeah. then we have to vote on, on it, agenda. then we have to do a second yeah. reading, you know. Right, and, and we know, we've already heard their agenda for March is like pretty packed, so we're not gonna be on the March agenda, so we're already looking at April optimistically, so yeah, just, it takes time. But I think it's, it's, it's deep, I mean, if, if the point is that we should have a check-in, that's a completely reasonable thing when you're creating a new regulatory framework, that the board take a look to make sure that it's meeting the needs, and if it um, needs to be adjusted, it can be adjusted. But I think that, uh, I think this framework overwhelmingly meets the needs and the requests of, of uh, those that have come forward to participate in the process, and, and it's been, that's why, so I'm comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with modifying, I'm not interested in modifying anymore. We made modifications at the last, including the input that you had requested on the bedrooms and a few other things that I wasn't actually comfortable with at the front side. I think that, that this, we've come to a, um, in essence, a, a compromise that I think will, will work and as long as we make a commitment to take another look at it, that's where I am. Yeah, I, I just think that if we, if we, whenever that 90 day window close and come back in 30 and 60 days after that window close and find out what the numbers are and, and everything, then you, we can make it, it's like, oh, there's, there's 150. Well, then 250, if, if you want to still have a cap, then 250 seems reasonable. But if 450 came in, then we would say, well, let's, let's reconfigure. So uh, I just think that's the, the, a better time to think about what a cap is because by its very nature, it's, it's arbitrary, right? I mean, it's, there's, no, there's nothing magic about 250, it could be, 215, it could be 390, you know, it's, there's, there, in that respect. Um, and my, and my overall sense is I'm just trying to, I'm trying to treat people as fairly as possible. And when I, when I think about the hosted rental owners and the vacation rental owners, um, uh, I, I can make a very sound argument that the home, vacation homeowners have a much greater impact on our community and our housing stock and its impact on the community than the hosted rentals. But we seem to be, we seem to have just a higher level of regulation on the hosted rentals. And that's the, that's the part that 
that it, it seems like we should try to find some way to be to, to treat everybody evenly. Is well, what then I'm using that argument, then we shouldn't include the hosted rentals within the SATA, Loda, and Davenport because if they don't have any impacts, they shouldn't be counted. But no, I, well, I don't no, I, because I, that's treat that's treating them the same way as the vacation rentals within those areas, which was a motion that you would actually, an amendment to the motion you would put forward. Well, uh, so, the, 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 uh, the reason why I think it's important to include in the caps in the designated areas is because uh, when we created the designated areas, what we were trying to do is prevent neighborhoods to becoming completely commercial it's sort of a backdoor way um, to turn residential neighborhoods into commercial outfits. That's what's not, we wanted to keep the residential nature of our neighborhoods. And, it, and if you have the, you know, three or four vacation rentals and three or four hosted rentals, you have a lot of people who don't, do no longer live in the community. Um, and we, we might be losing some of that residential character. So it makes sense to me. To, to include them towards the, that cap because there's a carrying capacity for a neighborhood, especially those coastal neighborhoods, which I'd like to respect to, to keep it for people who live here. Um, and, uh, and so keeping it as part of that makes, <coughs> makes sense to me and, and counting it towards it. But, but then treating them differently because they're gonna, they, I, I just, you know, that, that's, that's the part that's just sort of, I'm having a hard time with. Supervisor Kennedy. Um, so, I mean, I think we're, we're getting there. We've had a lot of discussion around this. I would say from my perspective, the vacation rental ordinance was written at a time when we weren't in a housing crisis that we were, and there is no way that we would pass as permissive a vacation rental ordinance today if it were in front of us. And so to the extent that you'd want people to, people should be treated equally, I think we should be looking at our vacation rental ordinances because they're having dramatic impacts. I agree. They have much dramatic impacts. and you know, reducing the, the numbers and the scope of that. Um, and I think this has been worked out pretty fairly. I'll say I got to the 250 because that's the, the platform, say there are about 200, and so we wanted to create room for existing plus more. If we get 1,000, we've created room for 1,000. Um, in this self-reported survey, uh, about 20% of people said that um, and that's recognizing the majority of people would not rent out to renters, but some people said they would rent out to renters. And we had a gentleman, um, the post, postman, who said he was renting out and now he doesn't. Um, if it's 20% of 250, that's losing, you know, whatever, uh, about 50 units of, house, of rental housing. If it's 20% of 1,000, that's 250 units of rental housing, which is far more rental housing than we've ever constructed. Uh, in a given year, so I think um, the magnet from for me this this 250 is a good benchmark based on what we know from the platforms, and again we can change it. Uh, we can get everyone in the system a big door, as you said, and then change it. But I'm not. I, I think I'm going to have big problems if we're talking about taking, you know, potentially 100 or 200 units off the market uh, that that otherwise could be could be rented. Supervisor Caput, did you say you wanted to add something to this? And then I, th I think we're prepared to vote. Please. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm ready to vote. I think actually, you know, all the recommendations are very close. You know, we're talking about caps and caps. Everything is, um, you know, is reasonable, I guess, for any In this case, I might surprise the department by giving the agreement to pass, but I want to say it's close. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. All right, so we have a motion. And I apologize for not having the uh, Mica. microphone on. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. So it passes three to two. Uh, that's the last item on today's agenda. Uh, I would like to thank Community TV and the Sentinel for being here today. Our next regular scheduled board meeting is February 6th in the chambers here. is an at-large patient representative for a term to expire December 16th, 2018, the nomination accepted on January 9th. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this appointment, final appointment? Seeing none, we'll take I move approval. Approve. Second. second. We have a, a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Caput. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now the final item on the agenda, 52.2, is to consider the final appointment of Will Forrest, the Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission, as an at-large labor representative for a term to expire April 1st, 2021, the nomination accepted on January 9th. Uh, seeing no one from the community on this item, is there a Move motion? to approve. Second. <laughs> have a motion yeah, from Supervisor shot. Caput and a second from Supervisor Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now we actually are adjourned until February 6th. I apologize about that.